Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. This is the June 7th, 2012 meeting of the National Capital Planning Commission. And please stand with me uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a big agenda today. Um, agenda item number one is the first I'll say we do have a quorum. And so we will proceed along the lines of the agenda as has been publicly advertised. And also would hasten to add that we are being live streamed. Um, so please note that. Um, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. And I only have one item to report. Um, the House Natural Resources uh, Committee, its subcommittee on national parks, forests, and lands, invited uh, NCPC to testify on our role in the commemorative works process uh, about the Commemorative Works Act. And I briefed the members of the subcommittee, I testified and I briefed the members of the subcommittee on our review process as it relates to our planning work, um, as such as the Memorials and Museums Master Plan and the Monumental Core Framework Plan and a copy of my testimony is at your, your workstations. Um, so it was a, a productive a productive meeting. Um, agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, uh, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. I just have a, a few announcements uh, to make today. Uh, first of all, we will be holding a, a public forum on the uh, draft federal environmental element of our comprehensive plan uh, this coming uh, June 27th, uh, which is a Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, that meeting will be held uh, at NCPC's uh, Commission Chamber. As also note, you'll have a copy of the environmental element, uh, which will be uh, part of the consent calendar today, uh, which will allow it to be uh, released for public comment and review. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, some new faces uh, at NCPC for uh, this summer. As you know, uh, we each summer we do have some great interns uh, coming into our agency to uh, uh, work on various projects here. And uh, this year we have five. Uh, students that began, uh, that began their summer internships here at NCPC. Uh, and I'd ask them to stand uh, when I announce their names. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Kristen Fulmer, who is a rising senior at Virginia Tech, uh, where she is pursuing a public and urban affairs degree with a concentration in environmental affairs and property management. Uh, Kristen? Uh, we also have Michael Lindbergh, uh, who has a Bachelor's of Arts in Architecture from Miami University, is currently pursuing a Master's of Community Planning degree at the University of Maryland. Michael? Uh, we have Hannah Dolan, who joined the Office of Public Engagement as a summer intern. Uh, Ms. Dolan is a rising senior at the College of St. Benedict's, uh, St. John's University in St. Joseph's, Minnesota. Uh, she also has a dual major in English and Political Science. Uh, we also have Cecilia Hagen, uh, who's joined the staff of the Office of General Counsel as a summer legal intern, but that basically doubles our legal staff at NCPC. Um, <laughs> Ms. Hagen has uh, completed her second year at uh, Wake Forest University School of Law in Winston-Salem. Uh, she's interested in the field of urban planning and municipal law. Uh, we have Julia Benjamin, who has joined the Policy and Research Division as a summer intern. Uh, Julia is in her third year of Bachelor's of Architecture program uh, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. And she has a very strong interest in planning and policy making, and she'll be working on commemoration efforts. Uh, we also have a, um, somebody from a DOD who is a uh, detailee to NCPC for the next three months. We have Rebecca Carroll, who is a community planner with the Naval Facilities Engineering Command, or NAVFAC. Uh, she began a three-month rotation with our Urban Design and Plan Review Division. Uh, we look forward to having Rebecca work with us as an opportunity to enhance mutual understanding between NCPC and NAVFAC on both project review and long-range planning issues. Also, uh, finally, I'd like to uh, note that after 33 years of federal service and including uh, 16 years at NCPC, Jean Keller, who's a community planner, at NCPC uh, retired last week. Uh, Jean worked on a multitude of key initiatives here, including the uh, draft comprehensive plan environmental element, which I spoke about uh, earlier today. 
He also served as the commission's ANIPA and environmental compliance officer. While serving with the Urban Design and Plan Review Division uh, previously, uh, Gene reviewed over 425 projects, uh, including master plans for Walter Reed Army Medical Center, the Armed Forces Retirement Home, and the National Institutes of uh, Health uh, Campus. Mm -hmm. He also was involved in high-profile projects such as the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, uh, the George, uh, Georgetown Waterfront Park, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. M National Memorial, and the U.S. Institute of Peace Headquarters. Uh, we do wish Gene a very happy retirement, uh, and we will miss him at NCPC. Uh, and that concludes my report, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Acosta, and I do want on behalf of the Commission to welcome our, our interns. Uh, we appreciate the contributions that you will make, and we hope by, we are certain that by working with our expert staff, you will take away um, a great deal of uh, a uh, very good work experience. Um, agenda item number three is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler? Uh. Okay, nothing to report. And agenda item number four is the consent calendar, and we have four items on the consent calendar. Item 4A is the comprehensive plan for the national capital federal elements, the amendments to the federal environmental environment element. To, uh, 4B is the North Road and General Services Building Retaining Wall at the National Zoo. 4C is uh, Site Improvements and Perimeter Security at the U.S. Institute of Peace Headquarters. And last, 4D is the New Recreation Center and Park Renovations at the Berry Farm Recreation Center. Uh, any questions or comments on the consent calendar uh, items? Hearing none, is there a motion? It's been moved and seconded that the consent calendar, the four items be adopted. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's adopted. Um, agenda item number 5A um, on the action agenda is uh, phase one of the north campus of the intelligence uh, community uh, campus in Bethesda. We have Mr. Hinkle, and I'll note that we have eight people um, signed up to provide public comment uh, at the conclusion uh, of our discussions. Mr. Hinkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has submitted uh, final preliminary and final site and building plans for Phase 1, which is the North Campus, the Intelligence Community Campus in Bethesda. And the Commission approved the master plan for this site in February of this year, and then also received an information presentation from the Corps itself um, in April of this year. And just to give you a little bit of background, this is the uh, re complete redevelopment of an existing federal facility in Bethesda. Um, the idea is to create a modern facility for up to 3,000 employees, um, <clears throat> maximize the use of some existing federal space, uh, meet some anti-terrorism and, and force protection requirements um, at the site, as well as improve the site's environmental um, impacts. And what we're looking at today is, is again, the North Campus. Um, and I apologize for this being flipped, so north is, is in this direction. But the North Campus consists of the parking garage element, um, the visitor, um, I'm sorry, the vehicle inspection station, as well as the visitor control center, and then a, uh, access um, roadway um, at the northern end of the site. Uh, this is another view of the site, um, just to orient the commission. Uh, the site's immediately northwest of the District of Columbia along the, the Potomac River, as you, as you see. Um, it fronts onto Sangamore Road, which runs through the community and, and <coughs> actually connects with MacArthur Boulevard down in this location. Um, and, but it's adjacent to some National Park Service property, in particular the CNO Canal runs in this location. Um, Clara Barton Parkway is also here. Um, the site's been a federal facility since 1945. It was uh, recently the, the former headquarters of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, but it was initially um, a site for the Army Map Service. Um, this is just another aerial view of the site, just to um, show you the surroundings and, and actually the, the site conditions at it, as it is today. Uh, the site is here in the center. Um, it's essentially five main structures and then a significant amount of on-site uh, grade-level parking. Um, some greenery here in this location. 
And then it's surrounded primarily by um, single family residential across the street. There is a shopping center uh, and, and then a little bit of, of multifamily in this location. Um, to the north is a um, neighborhood park as well as a um, private elementary school. And then again, you see the National Park Service property, um, Potomac River in this location. Um, phase one is essentially the north 12 acres of the site. However, um, the, the limits of disturbance for the site is just over 10 acres, and that's illustrated in this um, um, photograph here. And essentially what what is being proposed is construction on primarily the uh, a large portion of the existing parking lot. Um, as the commission is familiar with, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of locating the garage on the western side of, of phase one and how that impacts the forested area. So you can see in this um, illustration that essentially the, the portion of the forested area that will be impacted is in this location as well as a little bit along the edge. Um, the Army Corps has um, worked the site plan to preserve some existing trees along the north edge as well as this location here. And what I'll do is I'll quickly walk you through some of the elements of the phase one project and, and those include the parking garage, and again the vehicle entrance and the um, inspection station. Uh, the visitor control center. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the storm water management plan, as well as landscaping and some of the other site elements. So this is a, a general site plan um, for the phase one project. And again, the, the parking garage is, is along the west side. Um, I'll zoom in closer on, on, on the plan here. Um, what you have is a six level parking garage um, it's entered primarily um, from the north in two locations, uh, two entrances, two exits. Um, those are at the third level. And then through this access road that actually goes to the south campus, there's another um, garage entrance and exit on the second level. Um, if the commission recalls, what was approved in the master plan was what's referred to as, as a reverse berm and that's reflected in, on the plan in this location by the, the red line. And essentially what you have is the existing topography of the site um, coming down, so that's west as well as south, and then a, a um, graded portion of the berm coming towards the garage, so that would be in this location as well as this location. Um, what that allows is some screening for the garage. Again, it's six levels. So essentially what you're getting is where the existing elevation of the, of the existing um, parking lot is, is, is right here, approximately the, the top of the proposed berm. What you're getting is about three stories of the garage below ground and three stories of the garage above ground, um, at, at least from this angle, from the west side and the south side. Um, just also wanted to note in this, there is some bike parking being proposed within the garage, but the uh, core is also proposing a significant amount of bike parking in this location along the access road. Elevations of the garage, um, the top elevation is, is the one facing towards Sangamore Road, um, that's the east elevation. Um, southern elevation here facing the park side, west elevation facing the park side, then you have the north elevation on the bottom. Um, the garage is primarily um, precast concrete. What you do see are, are a few tower elements um, containing the stair staircases, at least on the, on the east elevation, and then there's two additional staircases that um, are not featured within the, the facades on, on the uh, west side. Um, these towers are, are uh, the materials a, a gray clad metal and then um, there's some some glazing within that and then um, obviously as you see there's a proposed green screen on both the south elevation and the west elevation. Um, what's indicated here in the um, diagram is, is a ridge line and that's actually the top of the berm 
um, that I just showed you there. And then I just wanted to note on the top of the garage is a uh, penthouse structure. And what this is proposed to do is hold an a, um, array of solar panels. And those panels would provide enough electricity primarily for the visitor control center as well as a vehicle inspection station. Just to focus a little more on, the, on that um, penthouse structure, um, this is the west side um, facing the, the park, south side facing the park, north side facing Sangamore Road, and then you have the north side here. So the penthouse is pulled back. The way the garage is structured is it's essentially four bays with a ramp um, in this location. So what's occurring on the top level is the ramp comes up and then you could go around to the other bays. What's being proposed is a penthouse structure over the ramp so you get the clearance that you need. Um, however, you also are able to construct a, a structure to support the solar panels. Um, there's been some discussion about how visible that is or, or will be. Um, so I pulled the, the Army Corps graphic again that you just saw regarding the berm and just to show the commission that if you set it set if you look at the setback of the penthouse at, at its smaller point so that's 61 approximately 61 feet and the penthouse has a height of 10 feet essentially if you're standing down um, towards the bottom of that reverse berm and this is on on Wapa Canetta Road which is just immediately northwest of the site um, it's going to be difficult to see and, and I think that's relatively obvious. There's a, a four-foot um, um, parapet, thank you, um, in this location. So essentially, it, it's, it's not necessarily visible. And you'll have the same condition on the south side as well. This is essentially the west side. From the north side, um, where the elevation's a little bit higher, what you'll have, um, at least from the, the neighborhood, um, from the neighborhood from the north and the park from the north is a set of existing um, mature trees. So the, that penthouse would be difficult to see from the north. And then it might be somewhat visible from the uh, Sangamore Road side. However, that's simply because the, the garage and the, and the site slopes down um, significantly from Sangamore Road towards the garage. So you might be able to view it somewhat, um, but uh, there's also a number of other elements, trees, the, the visitor control center, the, the vehicle inspection gate that might be blocking that view. Um, just on the bottom, uh, this is a illustrated view essentially of this and um, the proposed garage without the green screen. Um, but the penthouse would be approximately in this level below the parapet from that view. Um, Guess let me go back one second. There has been some, you know, recent discussions with the neighborhood, and, and I'm showing this, and I wanted to sh illustrate that the uh, garage is potentially not all that visible, I, or the, the penthouse on the garage is essentially not all that visible, but the core has been in discussions with the, the community, and they're actually open to revising the scheme a little bit, and you might hear some of that from the core today. Uh, going to the vehicle entrance and the inspection station, um, you have the roadway coming from the the north end of the site from Singamore Road, uh, swinging around, four, two lanes in, two lanes out, um, meets the gate. Um, there's a, a roadway configuration that would allow one of the exit lanes to um, become an, an entry lane and this would allow some um, increased processing for for the morning rush and keeping the, the queue um, shorter. On the north side is a truck inspection station. Um, you have some additional parking spaces um, reserved for guards, uh, three gatehouses, and a, and a larger structure that would support restrooms and some canine facilities and, and so forth. And essentially you have underneath the roof approximately 5,000 square feet. This is an elevation of that facility. Um, you have the east elevation, which is the elevation facing Sangamore Road, and um, then the others. 
what's being proposed is is the use of the same material that was on those towers on the garage. So it's a, a gray metal um, cladding, as well as you see some glazing in some areas. The visitor control center, it's been cited essentially to create a relationship with that gate structure and what is proposed for the south campus that we'll see in phase two is the primary main entrance to the redeveloped structures kind of in this location so you start to get a, an architectural relationship. Um, and this is just a close up of the site plan. Um, the visitor control center is in this location, uh, 24 space uh, parking lot for visitors, uh, pedestrian gate coming through uh, with an accessible pathway. Um, here you see kind of a, the security barrier in this location and then of course you come through, get your credentials and go back. Um, Pending completion of phase two, which I just discussed in the main entrance in this location, there is a pathway that comes down towards the garage and what will occur since the site is currently occupied by some employees, they'll come around this pathway down and enter a, a temporary entrance into the facilities down in this location. Um, elevations <coughs> of the visitor control center. Um, this is the east elevation facing Sangamore Road. Um, this is the north elevation. This faces the gate. And then you'll have the, the south elevation that'll face that, that primary entrance to the redeveloped facilities to the south. To get to stormwater management, um, this is what the commission saw in April. And what was proposed was an underground detention system, approximately 88,000 gallons. Um, bioretention pond, approximately 37,000 gallons, and drainage from the garage, from the access roads, coming into this um, vault, underground vault, be filtered in this location and exit out through what's the, at least I call the northwest corner outfall. Um, the bioretention pool would essentially take, and this is pervious surface here, take some of that runoff, as well as the runoff from this access road, filter it, and then that would eventually go out of the southwest outfall. The Corps has been working significantly to improve this scheme. Um, just to go back, this does meet MDE regulations in terms of the amount of stormwater runoff that it could capture and filter and release. But what's being proposed and, and what's been developed over the last couple months is, is really a significant increase in the amount of stormwater um, runoff that can be detained up on the north side and eventually filtered and released out, out of the outfall. So they've gone from um, approximately 88,000 gallons to um, close to 250,000 gallons. Um, both in this location as well as the outfall. And what they've been able to do is some additional engineering and right size this, this bioretention pond a little bit. Um, so it still captures what it needs to capture from this access road as well as from, from this pervious area behind the garage. However, um, because they've been able to reduce the size once they get into field to construct that, they're hoping that they'll be able to preserve some of the forested area that comes up in this area right here. So that's, that's also an advantage. Um, this is a schematic that the Corps showed to the commission back in April, and I just put it back in again so you could understand a little bit better how the, the water is um, collected and filtered and released. So what you have, again, is the underground vault in this location. And then now you have two additional underground vaults here. And those will collect the stormwater from the access road as well as the garage. And then as I noted, the, the bioretention pond is located in this spot that collects the, the runoff from this access road as well as this pervious area here. 
and then the remainder of the site is pervious area, so that will be um, water could filter through that. So where does this get the core on the site? Um, so they're able to actually, with this plan, collect, detain, and treat over 250,000 gallons in, in those four structures. So this is more than double what the MDE or the Maryland Department of Environment requires in terms of volume. Um, and it's actually almost triple um, what they were originally permitted for back in uh, January. Um, the, this, uh, this scheme also, um, I guess, equates to the treatment of the first 2.1 inches of rain across the North Campus. And this is both through the pervious as well as the impervious surfaces. So this is double the requirement um, to treat the first inch from impervious surfaces that uh, MDE requires. And then with this reduced peak stormwater discharge rate at the North Out, well, I, or this, the system reduces the peak stormwater discharge rate at the North Outfall between 80% to 20% um, from the current site conditions. And, and this range is a function of uh, what storm event that is. So you have based on one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 25 year analysis. Um, so really what this does is, is with a, a new outfall um, that's being developed to be MDE compliant, you have a significantly reduced possibility of downstream adverse erosive effects. Um, and let me, and I'll, I'll address the stormwater a little bit more, but let me just jump to the landscaping and other site elements. Because this is a design build project, um, some of the elements are not complete with the submission. So specifically, what you see here is a conceptual uh, landscape plan, some of the lighting, some of the, the um, other furniture that you might find on the site. Um, those design packages are not yet complete. So what we're looking at is for a, a further submission from the core to review those elements at this time. But I did put up this conceptual um, landscape plan just to show what the thought process is. And so the Corps has been working with the National Park Service and, and received a, a list of appropriate plantings and, and they're trying to work with that list and, and the planting plan and planting scheme here. But what, what you do see is some trees located towards the Sangamore Roadside as well as um, to further screen the garage entrance in this location and then some other trees in this location to just to provide shade and, and screen the garage, at least from um, the eastern side. What you see along this berm is, um, just for illustrative purposes, what's planned is once construction is complete on this berm, actually do a site walk and determine exactly the appropriate um, siting and, and number and species um, that would best screen the garage based on what exists out there, the existing trees, the existing branches. Um, so, th so this scheme will be done probably, you know, next spring or so once the garage is, is complete. So in terms of my analysis on what was submitted for phase one, um, what I did is really walk through some of the um, requests and requirements that the commission gave the applicant when it approved the, the master plan in February. So I'll just walk you through those, um, hopefully real quick. Um, so the commission noted that the applicant has committed to submit landscape design plans for each project phase to the National Park Service um, to ensure compatibility with the adjacent national park. And um, there has been continued dialogue with the National Park Service and as I mentioned, the, the National Park Service has um, provided a list of acceptable vegetation um, to help guide the landscape plan. Uh, also note that the applicant uh, has committed to submit building and landscape design plans for each project phase to the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, there has been continued dialogue with, with the, um, the Department of Planning from the, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, but you do, I believe, uh, have a letter um, in your packages today that um, 
notes that they had hoped for a um, official review by the planning board of this phase one. Um, so what the what we have committed to do and and um, the core has committed to do is is continue to work with them and ensure that at least phase two when that comes along in the future um, the planning board will actually have an opportunity to weigh in on on that phase um, and then the the third point the commission noted that the applicant has committed to participate in a joint traffic committee uh, this is with representatives from the community as well as montgomery county department of transportation um, and this traffic committee will uh, monitor, analyze, and evaluate traffic congestion and pedestrian safety related issues. And I'm, I believe this committee has formed, um, have developed some bylaws, and have met, I think, three times up to this date. Um, the commission also noted that the applicant is working with the U.S. Congress, the Department of the Army, um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Montgomery County, the National Park Service, and the community to address possible remediation of off-site stormwater runoff erosion and sediment damage um, that was caused by the previous tenant um, at the site. And my understanding is this dialogue has been continuing over the past number of months. Um, most, most recently, and maybe there, there's been further dialogue since, um, there was a meeting on May 2nd um, as well as as another meeting on on may 11 and that the parties have uh, decided to develop a multi-year plan and essentially develop a scheme to uh, remediate the north creek where the north outfall was um, following redevelopment to the north campus um, because you don't want to do that remediation while while it's under construction and then w within this plan um, identify remediation for the, the south outfall area, but not work on that until the development of the south campus is complete. And then my understanding is that the National Park Service is currently working to determine what type of remediation would be appropriate for the property. Uh, further, uh, the commission requested that the applicant submit um, a revised uh, master plan document as well as a traffic study and transportation management plan to reflect what was approved by the commission in february and i'm happy to report that the core has provided updated documents um, mid-april um, and then information demonstrating compliance with the maryland department of environment um, stormwater requirements as well as the federal requirements for section 438 um, of the energy independence and security act and what the core uh, actually has received from the maryland department of environment is a erosion and sediment um, control plan as well as a storm water water management permit um, from mde back in january of 2012 and this was based on the previous design and and which had the the different location for the garage and, and different approach to storm water um, so having revised that plan they have recently received uh, another erosion and sediment permit um, for the the revised scheme um, just recently this month they're finalizing their submission for the phase one stormwater management plan and that should be sent to mde by the end of the month um, and then they did provide staff with uh, documentation regarding their compliance with isa section 438 um, based on their original stormwater management plan, um, which they received a permit for back in January of 2012. And they will be providing additional um, documentation once they have their um, new management, um, stormwater management plan uh, approved by the MDE. And then finally, um, the commission requested a copy of the signed letter of commitment from the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency um, to the community, and, and that has been attached to the revised master plan that was finalized in April. Um, and then most importantly, I think, and what the most f um, discussion was focused on back in February with the approval of the master plan was um, for the um, applicant to really look at, at 
some targets that the commission set, and these included limiting deforestation on the site to no more than um, 0.2 acres. And as they illustrated and, and what these plans reflect is they've gotten that down to 0.45 acres from the uh, 0.75 acres that uh, was approved with the master plan in February. Um, but again, as, as I mentioned, they're actually hoping to get out in the field um, once construction has started and, and you know maybe get that 0.45 acres down a little bit further. Um, and then design a stormwater management, uh, design stormwater management facilities with the goal of treating and retaining 100% of stormwater for a 25 year storm. And so what I wanted to note is, is they do have a stormwater management plan that exceeds the Maryland requirements, um, but they actually have a system that has the capacity to pass through it the volume of a 25 year storm um, before it overflows. So what I showed you, the, the vaults and the, and the bioretention pond actually have enough capacity. So the 25 year storm drops water over a 24 hour period. So during that time, as water falls, the water is also being filtered out and going out of the outfall. So while the, the vaults and the bioretention pond aren't physically sized to hold the volume of a 24, 25 year storm, it actually can manage that storm water. Um, as it passes through over a 24 hour period. And then finally, um, encourage the applicant to continue close coordination with all the parties involved. Um, the applicant has been meeting with the community, um, meeting with the county, meeting with, as, as I noted, all the other parties, and I, I think they've done a, a relatively good job with that um, over the course of the past few months. So with that, um, it's, exec it's the executive director's recommendation that the commission approve the preliminary and final site and building plans for phase one, which is the north campus of the uh, intelligence community campus in Bethesda, but to delegate to the executive director approval of the final site development plans for the landscaping, um, site security, um, and site lighting. Um, as these design packages um, are currently under development. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any uh, immediate questions for Mr. Hinkle before we go on to the public comment section? Mr. Hart? Um, can you clarify how the green screening of the upper half of the garage occurs? In terms of... Are there planter boxes on the facade that these my understanding is it's, it's actually planted in the ground um, and will be brought up, these, these plants. But I think we could get some further clarification um, from, from the board. I don't think they, they would be successful with planters midway. So it's, it's not vines on a trellis or something that's covering the facade? You're actually trying to grow plants from the, the bottom of the garage to screen the top of the garage? Yeah, I, I believe it is a trellis, but, but it's structured so that the first three levels, which would be below that beam, are, are not, do not have the trellis on them, just the, where the pillars are to the garage, and it's brought up, and then the trellis is up. So it is a vine the type of screening. Okay. That's the second answer. question is, um, as I recall, this garage was supposed to replace all of the surface parking uh, in front of the, the buildings between there and Sagamore Street. Is that... Uh, one of the steps in this North Campus implementation, or is that being deferred, uh, the demolition of all that surface parking for the second uh, south phase? No, the, the majority of the surface parking um, will be taken out with, with this process. And the, the garage contains 18,000, 1,800, I'm sorry, 18,000 is quite a bit, um, 1,800 parking spaces, which is once the site is, once redevelopment to the, the whole site is complete, will be essentially all the parking for the site with the exception of the 24 space visitor parking lot. So once the parking garage opens, all that other surface parking becomes closed? That's correct. It's actually what, what they hope to do is construct this north campus 
and currently there, there's approximately 400 employees working at the site now. So they'll construct this north campus, have those employees park within the garage and be screened within the new facilities and then use the existing remainder of the parking lot for construction layover and so forth. Redevelop those south structures and then take away the remainder of that parking on that site and, and landscape the site. Mr. May. Yeah, I just um, I, I do have a couple of questions, but they're really for the um, for the core. And I was thinking actually it would be better if we waited till after the public comment right. period. So if we can have an opportunity to ask them questions, then yes, I appreciate it. Um, just a couple of points of clarification. Um, what is called Figure Eight in the report, the illustrative site plan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm unclear, uh, based on this diagram, kind of what are the movements, visitor movements, if you sure. come by car, bike, or you're a pedestrian. Um, there's a, something called a visitor inspection station mm -hmm. that's identified and a visitor control center that's identified. Um, yeah, so that, that'll, that'll work if you want to use that one. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's I see, I see a mislabel on on the. Figure oh, is it mislabeled? ER. I, All right, well, well, indulge me anyway, and just talk absolutely. to me about how. Yeah, let's go back. That one is good. How you would how how you would enter the site if you're a visitor? Sure. Walk, um, bike, and car. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, on within the EDR, the the visitor inspection station should be labeled vehicle inspection station, if that makes sense. So if you're a visitor, you'll enter through, pull into the garage, I mean the, the visitor parking lot, enter into the visitor control center and get your credentials. And then my understanding is you either stay parked and walk the pathway down to the facility or you get back in your vehicle and you're allowed to pass through the gate. And your vehicle gets inspected? That's my understanding. So every vehicle that enters this gets inspected? Enters the garage? Yes. Like the trunk gets opened and people look under the carriage, that kind of thing, for 1,800 vehicles a I day? Will, yeah, I'll let, I'll let the core respond okay. to those operational questions. Um, okay, and, so, and, if you're, and if you're coming by car, that's great. Uh, so that path there is a pedestrian only path, right the, the one by the garage, or not? Is that a road? The this one is a, an access roadway. So there's a delivery. Sidewalk? There's loading. There's there's those functions down in the. Okay. In the well, your ultimate themselves. destination, if you're coming as a pedestrian, is not the garage, right? You're going s into that's, some other that's building. Correct. So how are you moving as a pedestrian? There's a pedestrian path coming from Sangamore Road. Uh -huh through here to okay. the visitor control center, out of the visitor control center, down this pathway, and down here. Now this is a temporary situation until the south campus is complete. And what will occur is you'll have a main new building here that connects the existing buildings, and you'll have a main front door at this location. So when phase two comes along, essentially you'll come through the visitor control center straight into the primary entrance here. Okay, now you're coming by bike. What do you do? There's an entrance here. You come here. There's bike parking in this location. Okay. Or I would assume you come through as an employee through here down, and there's parking along this side or parking within the garage. For your bike. For your bike. Okay. Um, one, one other question is the stormwater. Um, we, the, the language that was used in the EDR was uh, retain mm -hmm. um, for a 25-year 20, uh, uh, storm event. Um, but what you described was detaining, not retaining. So detaining is to slow the movement of the water. Retaining is to keep it on site or percolate it into the ground. So do you know if they're retaining or detaining the water? My understanding is that it's the opposite. You retain until it goes through some filter process and then exit onto okay, the Okay, so you think they've side. met the requirement? Correct. Okay. 
Thank you. Further questions before we go on to public comment? We will bring uh, we'll bring it back to our to the uh, to the commission after public comment session. Um, we do have eight people signed up to speak. Uh, three people are representing organizations, and if you're representing an organization, you have five minutes. There are five people representing themselves, and you will have three minutes. So of the eight, the first three are uh, Mr. Donald O'Connell, uh, second will be Mr. Stephen Salop, and third will be Mr. Brad Northrop. Uh, so Mr. O'Connell, welcome. My name is Donald O'Connell, and I'm the chairman of the famous Joint Traffic Committee that you're all quite familiar with. And I think you have in your package the bylaws, as um, Mr. Hinkle referred to, of the Joint Traffic Committee. And they were developed with both the DIA and the community, and we're happy with those bylaws. I'm also the president of the Sumner Citizens Association, and Sumner is a community of about 550 single-family homes to the east side of Sangamore Road, and is the largest community impacted here. Now, you should all be aware, obviously, that this is a huge facility that, on its completion, will have more than 800,000 square feet, which is a major building by any standards. It's more than a mile from any road that's a state road or a four-lane highway, so traffic is obviously a huge and major issue. But we've met three times in the Joint Traffic Committee. Um, the first time we met as an organizational meeting, we elected a chair and a secretary and all that kind of stuff and decided how we were going to proceed. And we agreed we would meet monthly, or as needed, as things went on. And I think we anticipate that this Joint Traffic Committee will meet for a tremendously long time until the operation of the facility. And obviously, phase two will not be operational for more than three or four years. So it's going to be around for a long time. In the second meeting, we met with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. And they presented their, their, um, what their study design would be going forward to do a baseline study of all the major intersections that will be impacted by this facility, which would be Sangamore Road and its intersection with MacArthur Boulevard at the south of the site, Sangamore Road and its intersection with Massachusetts to the north of the site, and then some other intersections that are further out MacArthur Boulevard where it intersections with the Clare Barton Parkway, and then also some pedestrian tra um, safety issues that are impacted in between. Um, the third meeting, we reviewed the transportation management plan, which was the new management plan that the DIA and the intelligence community has, has, um, has generated. And I think we're reasonably happy with that, um, with that plan. Uh, we have several recommendations. The first is that the Navy, who is due to occupy the Del Carlia section of what used to be the NGA site, has been totally non-responsive and has not responded to, the, to invitations to join the traffic committee. In fact, has not been responsive at all. Um, and obviously, that's a big disappointment to us, but they've just been you know, missing in action. Um, now, we all know that when Navy built their Navy medical facility up on Rockville Pike, they were also not responsive to the community, but it ended up in a big mess that everyone's tried to dig themselves out of since. So that's obviously a very large concern for us, that Navy figures they want to do what they want and worry about the, um, the consequences later. So that's a big issue. The second is that in order to, to encourage transit and carpooling use, which is critical in a facility like this, where we have 800,000 feet of Class A office space, but parking for 1,800 vehicles, which is probably a little under park for a suburban facility, but it's, this is not totally a suburban facility. It's not like we have access to the Beltway or to state roads immediately next to the facility. We need to encourage carpooling in a big way. The DIA have been running a shuttle service, a free shuttle service from Friendship Heights. We have not seen the results yet of a, um, a zip code analysis, so we don't know where all the future employees are going to come from. In any event, it's moot because they might be different people in two or three years' time. But I think we feel that it's essential that tariff pricing or parking pricing, which is normally not charged for intelligence um, employees at suburban locations, has to be on the table. And if it means that in the future people have to pay $20 a month to park a single occupancy vehicle, that's the way it's going to have to be. So I think that um, we're reasonably happy with how things have been going. Obviously, the jury is still out on a lot of things yet. Um, but we're happy enough with how things are going. We've taken the summer off. We're not going to meet again until September. Construction has started at the site in terms of demolition. 
and there have been some noise issues. They've not been major. Obviously, they, the people who are immediately affected are very irate about it and think it is a big issue. Others are not so concerned about it. But it's moving along, and clearly Clark is a very responsible contractor, and they have plenty of signage and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's about it, and there are my comments. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to respond to them. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Connell. I uh, appreciate it. Mr. Salop? Yeah, Mr. Hinkle, could I have the slides, please? Yes. Uh, the slide of the, uh, the PV array coming up. Uh, I'm Steve Salop. I'm from the Wapakoneta Road Committee. Um, I, I'm going to speak about the PV array and the delegation issue and information generally. Uh, my colleagues are going to talk about stormwater management. Though much of what I have to say today will, will relate to the stormwater management as well. Uh, I have two recommendations uh, for the Commission. The first is uh, that in light of the substantial visual uh, impact of the PV array, uh, I recommend, I hope, that the Commission uh, condition its approval on the Corps eliminating this adverse impact, either by deleting the array, uh, moving it, or taking other correction, corrective action. Uh, secondly, uh, the EDR had a recommendation that the Commission delegate uh, further approvals to the executive director, and I would recommend that in light of the history of this project and the various problems that have occurred, that that delegation not be made, uh, at least not, not at this time. So I want, I want to talk about those issues. Um, the PV array is going to have a substantial negative adverse impact. Uh, it's really large. It's 10 or 15 feet high. The 10 feet is just the structure. The panels are going to be on top of it. Uh, the dimensions of it are about 150 feet uh, by 60 feet. Uh, it will uh, be visible from Sangamore Road. Uh, from the, on the east elevation, it'll be uh, visible on the west elevation from my neighborhood in Wapakoneta Road. Could, I, could you show the, uh, the slide that's got the, uh, the, the, the sight line? Um, No, it's earlier. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, we'll I, I'll, I'll get back to that. I don't want to waste my time on this. Uh, it's, uh, okay, well, this sight line. You'll have to stay at for recording purposes. Yeah. That's from the, that sight line is from the ground. The Wapakoneta neighborhood is up across there above the trees. So we will, uh, we will see it. And, of course, you will see it from uh, Sangamore Road. So it's large. Uh, unlike the rest of the garage, you will not have a green screen. So it'll be, it'll be very visible. It will look different. Um, I also want to emphasize, and this relates to the whole issue of delegation of authority and so on, that it came as a great shock. We only found out about this PV array two weeks ago. Uh, the agreement that was made between the Corps, the Defense Intelligence Agency of the neighborhood back in January did not have this array in the agreement. We only found out about it on May 23rd, okay? Indeed, the uh, uh, Admiral Manselman, who is the uh, deputy director of the DIA and the executive director of the project, he hadn't seen the drawings until May 23rd. Um, so, you know, it, it came as a big surprise. There, uh, Admiral Manselman has suggested that it could be downsized. Uh, there's talk that maybe the panels could be moved to Maury Hall. Maybe the panels could be moved on top of the visitor center. Maybe there could be a green screen. All of those possibilities are open, and Admiral Manselman seems uh, positive on, on the role of uh, doing something, but nothing's been done. And uh, for that reason, we would, we would like you to wait and, and see, what, see what happens. If it can't be fixed, we think it should be deleted. Uh, it's not essential to the project. It's designed to achieve zero net energy for the visitor center. That's quite a laudable goal, but I don't think it justifies the adverse trade-off. In any event, no analysis has been done uh, of the trade-off. So we would like you to condition your approval on further analysis of this PV array. Um, conditioning your approval on that also eliminates, also will serve the goal of transparency. It'll signal to the Army Corps of Engineers that secrecy has no place in the process of community engagement and that they should be providing more advance notice to the community and to, uh, and, and, and to the commission for that matter. Uh, it's been argued that that might cause some delays 
Uh, I don't see why it would, but if it does cause delays, any delays in this project being caused by needing to give information to the community have come before the court because the core did not provide that information uh, previously. The core has systematically withheld information until the last minute. Uh, they've then provided very incomplete information with inadequate documentation. They shouldn't be rewarded for this behavior. To set, to set signals going forward, uh, we need to incentivize the Corps to give out the information in a timely fashion. For the same reason, I don't think that you should delegate to the executive director just yet. In light of the history of this project, uh, intervention by the commission may be necessary in the future when there are other surprises, like another PV array. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sala. Uh, next is Mr. Northrop, and Mr. Northrop will be followed by uh, Harold Fall, and after Harold will be Mr. Arthur uh, Zeisel. Mr. Northrop, welcome. Th yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Brad Northrop. I am. Uh, I live in the community of Brookmont, which is uh, located right below this, uh, surrounded by national park land. Uh, and I've been on a small team of people that have worked with um, community leadership, with working with Mr. Mansell and the Corps in this project over the last several months. Uh, I have a similar recommendation to what Mr. Sellup just said, but I'm going to focus on stormwater and stormwater management. Um, and ask that the commission not approve this uh, design uh, and plans for the phase one North campus. Uh, my concern is that future approval and, and my interest is in having future approval be conditioned upon providing evidence that the proposed stormwater management design will adequately reduce stream channel erosion, pollution and sedimentation. Our concern is mainly with what happens with the water leaves the site and what is the implication of the work they're doing there uh, on that. And also, we, relative to that, we're not, we request that, we not that you not delegate approval final site development to the executive director. I do want to recommend or uh, recognize the good work of the Defense Intelligence Agency in working with the community. They've been very good at engaging us uh, in, in the last several months on several issues, including the, you know, the uh, impact on deforestation. And they, we uh, commend them for the progress they've made in expanding the stormwater management design. Um, and though, although it's still in a preliminary um, stages, um, there's very good work that appears to be going on in terms of collaboration with the National Park Service and remediation um, on the site. Uh, but the stormwater impact at the site is a really critical issue. Uh, since the discharge of this uh, from the site flows through Park Service land, impacts the CNO Canal, Canal National Historical Park and the Potomac River Gorge, which is one of the most biologically important areas uh, on the East Coast. Um, historically, it has been stormwater releases from the site that has created existing significant erosion and sedimentation. And uh, it is that concern about, again, what happens after the water leads the site that is concerning us. While transparency is, uh, has been there in the engagement process, is at this point, there's just inadequate information on stormwater management, and it's leaving us sort of in the dark at this point. And four points about that. We have re requested an analysis that would provide the link between discharge of the site and impacts on downstream erosion and sediment flow, and this has not been received. We will not see the completed stormwater management plan um, for the North Campus until it's submitted to MDE at the end of June and Ju or July, early July, as it says in the report. And we are not certain the impact analysis will be part of that submission. We do not have information that justifies the claim in the executive director's recommendation that peak stormwater charges significantly reduce potential for downstream adverse erosive effects. And as noted in the conformance appendix to the document, uh, the National Park Service is supposed to receive um, stormwater calculations for the North Campus, and those have not been forthcoming at this point. So given the incomplete information provided so far, that assessment is not, po it's not a possible for us to make an assessment of what the impact of stormwater discharge on the site will be on, for downstream conditions. And for that reason, we're recommending uh, that this commission not approve this final plan and not delegate its authority to the executive director. We don't feel there's a need to rush at this point, nor do we think it's prudent to do so. Thank you.
My name is Harry Fole. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm a resident of Glenico Heights and have previously appeared before you as president of Glenico Heights Citizens Association. However, I've been uh, term limited out of office and hence today I'm in, appearing as an individual. In our multi-neighborhood testimony on February 2nd, we requested the following. USACE, the Corps, should designate stormwater management facilities with goal of treating and retaining 100% of stormwater for a 25-year storm, subject to potential constraint of not causing additional deforestation. USACE should also submit detailed engineering analysis to justify its plans if it's unable to reach this goal. Subsequent to that meeting, the NCPC posted the following on its website. In its approval, the Commission also requested the applicant to strive to design stormwater management facilities with the goal of treating and retaining 100% of the stormwater for a 25-year storm. A 25-year storm is a considerable storm. For most of us, that would have occurred twice in our lifetime. The ICCB stormwater management plan has met the requirement of retaining 100% of the stormwater for a 25-year storm <coughs> and exceeds the MD requirement for treating the first one inch of stormwater by treating 2.1 inches or over 100% more than the minimum requirement. There is now discussion as to whether the extent of retention of stormwater is sufficient to adequately protect the stream channels against significant further erosion. I'm not an expert in such matters and cannot contribute to the question of efficiency, or sufficiency rather, <coughs> excuse me. However, the goal set forth in February for retention was achieved. Goals addressed by such terms as sufficient, adequate, or significant are subject to arbitrary judgment. Arbitrary standards leave the engineers with no confidence that whatever is designed is sufficient since sufficient is not defined. That is unreasonable, especially so in light of how much has been achieved. Given the huge progress that has been made in all fronts, I wish to bring up a material consideration that has not been discussed before, and that is the mission of the ICCB. A year or two ago in the Washington Post, uh, the Post had an article on the Office of National Director of Intelligence citing a lack of success in getting the numerous intelligence agencies to cooperate as desired. Clearly bringing senior figures together from disparate cultures to work in the same physical environment promotes relationships and that eases teamwork toward common goals. I inquired as to whether or not one of the objectives of the ICCB was to achieve significant improvement in interagency cooperation and the response was yes. It is a matter of common sense that effective intelligence is a crucial factor in dealing with the international problems that we're facing. Hence, it is also a matter of common sense that it is in our collective interest for the development of the campus to proceed with minimal delay. With that in mind and with appreciation for all that has been accomplished and with gratitude to all who have participated, including my colleagues uh, who we've been meeting with for the past uh, uh, numerous months, I'm concerned that further delay in commencement of the project will outweigh any residual benefits that may be achieved. Therefore, I urge the NCPC to approve the master plan, but with one minor condition relocation of the photovoltaic array and penthouse for the array that have very recently been added to the top of the garage. My understanding is that the intelligence community is agreeable to such a request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fall, very much. Uh, Mr. Zeisel? Well, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. That's, Welcome. That's the German pronunciation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arthur Zeisel. Uh, I'm speaking as an individual, even though I've been requested to speak by the Sumner Citizen Association and the Brookmont Civic League. Uh, my background and education is that I have a PhD in hydrogeology with a minor in civil engineering. Uh, professionally, I've worked as a resources planner for the Northeastern Illinois Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, which had jurisdiction over the six county Chicago metropolitan area, where I co authored a, a comprehensive water resources planning and management study. Uh, for that six county area, which is a prototype study. Uh, I've worked for the federal government for over 30 years, half the time with the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the Office of Policy and Research, where I was a water resources specialist. Uh, I also was the agency rep to the uh, National Water Resources Council, uh, where they did river basin planning and the Committee on Hydrology. The other half of my career is with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, where I was a policy manager for hydrogeology. Uh, where I did with work with science policy and research, uh, conceived and managed research and demonstration projects uh, in natural hazards, uh, including floods, uh, as earthquakes and so forth. Uh, my initial review of the uh, site material provided by the Corps excited me because uh, they are requiring required to show leadership in stormwater management. Uh, the executive order, presidential executive order 13508, 
uh, develops a strategy, requires development of a strategy for protection and restoring the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, the Army has adopted a, also a policy to lead in water resources management. All these things made me think that this was a great opportunity here in this site to show what, in fact, can be done. I was more excited when I read the MDE, Martin Department of Environment, uh, Stormwater Management Guidelines for State and Federal Projects. Uh, that, those guidelines are excellent and do reflect the new thinking in stormwater management to emphasize the non-structural approaches to stormwater management and retention of the water, not detention, as the point was made earlier. Uh, the, 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 the thrust of those regulations require environmental site design approaches, which are basically required before the structural measures can be uh, considered for uh, stormwater retention. Uh, the uh, also require a very detailed plan emphasizing the ESD uh, measures. I was less excited, however, and uh, somewhat concerned when I read the information provided by the Corps, where they're only going to use a very few of the ESD measures, the non-structural approaches measures. And I have to say that my review of the plan as submitted when you measure it against the requirements of the Maryland Department of Environment, it is not a plan. Uh, I would recommend that they not approve the plan. I think what we should do is to push for more consideration of the uh, environmental site design approaches and to actually require a plan. Uh, until that, and I think we should really insist that the Corps show leadership in this method and in, in this whole site and not just uh, the minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zazel. The last three um, speakers are first, Mr. David Berg, second, Ms. Nicole Lurie, and then last will be Mr. David Hearn. Mr. Berg, welcome. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony again on behalf of the Civic League of Brookmont. Uh, like my colleagues, um, I compliment uh, Admiral Manselman and his DIA team for very significant improvements in every area of concern. Uh, there's a night and day improvement in almost every area. The one that stands out for where that's not true is stormwater, which has improved somewhat but not sufficiently. Um, mere compliance with, uh, with stormwater management minimums is not adequate for this site given its very sensitive location. History demands special attention to stormwater management here. Um, this slide shows some of the sediment damage to the CNO Canal uh, from erosion in the North Stream. The history of stormwater management here is absolutely appalling. The, the stream should be draining directly into the Potomac, but the drain is, is clogged. Uh, here we see a phase two area of severe erosion uh, that the Park Service calls impairment. Um, we must avoid a repeat of this. And their plans, which are inadequate, as Mr. Zizel just explained, um, don't show that we'll get there. To distill it down to a simple statement, again, our, we've said this all along, our goal is to protect uh, we, that, this, that the solid, that the stormwater management facilities on the north campus protect against significant renewed erosion and sedimentation. We've been very clear. And there is real cause for our concerns. Um, with analysis and transparency, the site can achieve sufficiency. We've had neither. We've not seen any of the data to support uh, the conclusions that have been presented uh, by the staff. Um, how would it work uh, to, uh, to get there? Um, by paying attention specifically to pre-development characteristics. This is the fundamental principle in the guidelines of the state of Maryland, and that guidelines is, are not being, that portion of the guidelines, the controlling part is not being addressed, and uh, they need to do an analysis of the downstream conditions, and I believe that MDE will ultimately require them to do that. 
um, the issue becomes, will erosion and therefore sedimentation be significantly reduced? And no one can answer that sufficiency question now. Uh, and if they can, they haven't showed us the data that exists or may not exist at all. Um, I'm not going to go into ESD more than ART did. Uh, pretty clearly, they are not using ESD. None of the structures proposed are ESD according to uh, the chapter of the Maryland State Manual on ESD. Um, Art also spoke about the executive order on the Chesapeake Bay. The site team never mentioned this executive order. The EDR does not mention the executive order. And I think that there's a real question of whether the plan for the North Campus is sufficient for compliance with the requirement for federal leadership. Um, in addition to the three first items here, which Brad listed, I suggest four additional items. Um, the, we need to have um, the information base that it will take to determine the adequacy of these plans and to improve the record of environmental stewardship uh, with the executive order and the goal of protecting the parks. Um, if, the, if, the, if the site team can't prove this, then they should simply provide professional certification that there will not be uh, downstream erosion and sedimentation. They won't do that. I predict they won't do that. Again, I'm not referring to 100-year storms, but smaller storms. So at what flow rate did the tree fall? The EDR report table on page 23 shows existing and proposed flow rates in different storm events for the Northwest outfall. What flow rates pre-existed development? We don't know. What flow rates will be protective of the North Stream? We don't know. The term that Mr. Hinkle used, managed release, is a severe misnomer. Flow will be 24, 23, 24,000 gallons per minute in a 25-year storm. Right now, it's 28,000. There's very little detention taking place in larger storms. This is the result. Um, this is one of the 12 specimen trees that you were told would be protected under the original proposal that was brought to this group. Um, it fell under the Corps' stewardship of the site, either in late December or early January. So I submit to you that until the Corps studies the North Stream's capacity and shares the results, we will not know what flows are safe and be able to plan accordingly. So I encourage you again to not approve the stormwater aspects of this and require the data be developed. Thank you, Mr. Thank Berg. You. Ms. Lurie. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Nicole Lurie, and I'm a resident of Wapakoneta Road. I think you're used to seeing my husband here, Jesse Goodman. I'm pinch hitting today. Um, let me begin, um, uh, as others have, by complimenting Admiral Manzelman on his leadership and work with our community. It's been very welcome and very constructive. I today would like to echo the recommendations made by Steve Salop and others. My goal today is to come before you and request, however, that in addition to those recommendations, that you require of the Army Corps of Engineers, DIA, and the neighborhood an after action review to take a look from soup to nuts at lessons learned from this process in the hopes that this misfortune could be prevented in the future. The neighborhood has spent thousands and thousands of hours working on this issue. The Corps of Engineers similarly has spent many hours and quite a bit of money, as has the DIA, for a situation that in my mind was largely preventable. And so I'd like to suggest you do this after action review and that you as the NCPC take into account the lessons learned and incorporate them into your practices going forward and suggest to the Army Corps of Engineers that they do the same. I had hoped that one of the lessons learned would have been about transparency and listening to the community and community input. And until recently, I was feeling as though we were on good track. But the May 23rd surprise, which many of us learned about actually after May 23rd, with the photovoltaic cell on top of the parking garage, well after we in the neighborhood had an agreement with the Corps of Engineers and others about what this parking garage would look like and where it would be sited, suggests to me um, 
that that lesson has not been learned. And as Mr. Salop pointed out, the sight line, at least from my house, is directly across the hill. Um, yes, I will be impacted by that photo of Say Excel, and we'll see it every morning when I wake up and every night when I go to bed. Uh, similarly, the lessons learned about stormwater management and listening to the community and their concerns about that um, have not been learned and suggest that we still don't have adequate listening and, and adequate process for community consultation going forward which is disappointing. So that leads me to conclude, I'm afraid, that continued consistent vigilance by the community throughout this whole process is going to be necessary. And unfortunately, continued and consistent vigilance from you as a commission will also be necessary. So my recommendation as well would be that you defer approval until the issue with the parking garage, the structure on top, and the photo of the KXL is completely resolved. And I do not have confidence right now in the process at all to enough to suggest that you delegate authority to the project manager for the reasons I think I discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Laurie. And Mr. David Hearn. He's not here. He couldn't come at the last minute. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, that ends our public comment uh, period, and we'll return uh, the discussion to the commission members. Uh, at this time, it may be prudent to have uh, a core representative to come up who can speak technically to the project. And uh, I believe Mr. May has some questions, and Ms. Dragoning can re-ask her questions regarding um, ve you know, how and how many vehicles are inspected. Uh, so, and there will be other questions, too. So. Sir, if you don't mind, my name is Jim Manselman, and I'm the owner's rep on the project. And there couple questions I want to answer and then sure. uh, um, Jared here will answer the stormwater management because I'm not a civil engineer by any means I'm an architect yes sir well yes uh, Jim Manselman great thank you welcome a um, couple things first of all I, I've been working very hard with the community and we continue to work and, and I'll be working through this project with them uh, as, as we develop it um, on the um, an easy one to talk about is the uh, PV panels that were talked about. Uh, obviously, we're trying to do a zero net energy. Um, and one of the things about transparency is, and working with the neighbors, is sometimes in, in this particular case, I think Mr. Salt mentioned it, uh, he actually got to see a drawing before I even had a chance to see it as the owner's rep because I would have known looking at it that we didn't want anything on top of the garage. So we are working with the team to lower the profile of that uh, and look for other alternatives. So it, we're working through that, and I think that's a design feature we can uh, clearly take take uh, care of. Uh, there's a question about screening of vehicles, and I can just answer that very quickly. There is not a, as Mr. Henkel mentioned, a vehicle inspection that is a physical stop, open the car, and do all that. If you have a visitor that goes to the visitor center, they can be issued a badge, and when you go through the vehicle checkpoint, they can go back through in the garage by showing that badge. So there is a, not a, uh, it's a showing of a badge, but not a physical stop and inspection of the vehicle. Uh, periodically, uh, given certain threat conditions, they will do a random check, and there's a lane that you pull off to do that random check, and there they'll use a, uh, Generally, they use a guard dog to do that, uh, but that's a random occurrence. So visitor or employee uh, that go through that will show a badge and, and move forward. Uh, and then um, stormwater management before I turn over to Jared. Uh, just a couple points. One of my uh, goals of this project, and, and I clearly believe we're going to achieve that, is that you, you saw the original picture with all the surface parking on the site. Uh, by eliminating that parking and turning it back in landscaping and building that parking garage, uh, we reduce the water runoff from the site when complete by about 43%. In my mind, that's huge for an existing site that's been uh, with the water runoff that it currently has today. And, and, and I think uh, we can attain that. The other thing in the detention, and again, I'm not an expert on detention or retention. Uh, but I know that we have significantly increased from that 88,000 gallons up to the now 250,000 gallons to detain water on site, filter that water before it 
goes uh, into the stream bed. And then the last and third point I would make with you uh, is I promised the neighborhood and the community that I would work very hard even though there were prior tenants there, uh, but I would work really hard with the Army BRAC, uh, the Corps itself, and also the National Park Service, and I've personally hosted the meetings on that to discuss the remediation of the damage that has been done. And, and we have opportunities there, and it's going to be a four or five year plan as we develop the project, because you have to complete new work uh, to reduce the runoff to then repair anything in the stream beds that goes down or help the uh, National Park Service with the uh, canal itself. And, and there'll be monies there to help them dredge. Uh, so we've made that commitment to them. Again, I'm hosting that. I'm, I'm not driving that, but, but that communication has gone very well, uh, and we're working through a plan there to solve that. Uh, and that, I'll turn it over to Jared to answer the stormwater management, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Jared Olson with the Corps of Engineers. Welcome. It's good to see you all again. I do not have any prepared remarks, so if we want to go straight to the questions, sure. I will be yes, happy sir. to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Manselman. Mr. Manselman, can you come back up? I have a sir. question of uh, Mr. Manselman, and first, I appreciate your candor in yes, telling us that you. you were a little surprised by seeing those cells as well. Um, and you commented that you were working to lower the profile and other alternatives and that you thought you could easily take care of that. So yes, give us an idea of what some of these alternatives could um, be. Could you take them off the garage and put them in a different place? If I had a whiteboard, place? I could draw. But if you can visualize in a, uh, in a, in a parking garage, I know you've all been in them, and the, the trend now is when you do a transition from level to level, most of them do that with a full parking ramp that is the full width 60 foot or 61 feet or 62 feet, and it's the length of the garage as the ramp transitions, you go up that lane and you're on the next level. And so if you visualize something that's sloping up this direction, uh, and then you come at this end of it, which already has a parapet height for safety so people don't walk over this edge, if you put that uh, PV panels on top of that, you're basically at the parapet height, and that is that, you know, Mr. Salp was talking about something was up here 10 or 12 feet, what I call lowering the profile of bringing it down, because you're still vehicle clearance. You know, parking garage vehicle clearance is only about seven foot or so, so we have plenty of room in here. So I've got a 60 foot width, and then you put it over that top, and a car still comes up and clears this edge. So that, that's clearly one thought. Uh, another suggestion was made, do we put it on Maury Hall or one of the other existing buildings that we're keeping? That's a possibility. Uh, we could do it on the visitor center itself, uh, but that roof area is relatively small. Uh, so I, I think the parking garage solution is what we're looking at first um, to, to see if we can make that work and keep the profile very low. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. May. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to everyone who's been working on this. Um, uh, the Corps and Mr. Man Manselman and um, also the neighbors who've been working very closely with my colleagues in the Park Service to try to make progress on this project. And it's come a long way from where, where it was, certainly. Um, and what I heard today is a confirmation of what I have heard from my colleagues, which is that even though it's come a long way, there is still uh, a certain lack of understanding um, or lack of information about um, whether we are doing everything that we need to do in terms of um, the stormwater uh, strategy uh, to prevent future problems like the ones that we have now that have to be remediated. Uh, and I guess, you know, I had... Um, been thinking of, about some of the more specific questions, but I think what it really boils down to for me is that we heard several people suggest that a, a vote um, to approve uh, should not be taken today. My core question is, if it was not taken today, what would that do to your schedule, and is this something that could be deferred so that you could do a little bit more communication or research or whatever is necessary to satisfy both the Park Service and the neighbors? I think as uh, Mr. Fole 
pointed out that I'm not sure that uh, we'll ever quite be able to get to the uh, point of having sufficient information to satisfy. Uh, what we can say with certainty is that the uh, improvements that we made on the site to include doubling the detention volume since we were here last in April um, will um, significantly reduce the likelihood of adverse erosive effects downstream. <coughs> Uh, that the permit that's issued to us by MDE, which the site has already been permitted once for a set of conditions at a uh, much lower detention volume, uh, a much larger garage, uh, will in fact um, meet the requirements of the law for MDE and for uh, ESA as far as their requirements go as, uh, for protecting or preventing uh, downstream adverse erosive impacts. Uh, presently, the, the work has commenced on the site, as was indicated. Utility work is underway, and we do have an approved uh, erosion and sediment control permit issued by uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, the uh, continued discussion on the stormwater beyond what we've developed so far and uh, looking at uh, uh, additional information, which I'm not sure there's many more ways that we can look at it, I think will only serve to uh, expend additional resources that won't really necessarily improve the stormwater management plan on site. Okay, well, that's an interesting answer, but it's not the question I asked, okay. which was, what does it do to you if we don't take the vote today? I think that um, you'll ask us to come back. We'll expend more resources, more dollars to answer the questions uh, that won't substantially change the answer that we will provide. Okay. Um, does it wind up, um, I mean, is there anything critical about the, the, uh, the approval today? Does it allow you to do something that, uh, uh, that you could just easily accomplish next month? I think that the issue would be, uh, how it might be perceived by the commission that we're continuing to work on the site and, uh, pursue the construction activities that we're doing in advance of getting the approval of the uh, phase one design. Okay. Um, the, uh, it seems to me that there is certain information that um, at least my colleagues have said has not been uh, shared. I don't know whether it exists and hasn't been shared or what, but you've made certain determinations, particularly with regard to uh, ESA 438 um, and the determination that you meet that requirement. Um, I don't know what was actually said in meetings, but the certainty about meeting that requirement that I saw on paper from NCPC staff is not what was communicated in those meetings, or at least not what was heard in those meetings by my, my colleagues. Um, there it seemed that the, the contention was that, well, you don't really need to comply with it. Um, it. There is a determination, or there is something on paper that says that you meet it within, to the maximum extent, technically feasible. Um, uh, we don't know exactly what that means or how that determination was made. There's, and the NCPC just has a letter saying that it, that has happened. So um, is there information that you can provide that demonstrates that, you know, you've done the appropriate analysis and this really is the maximum uh, extent feasible? And also, can you share information about the pre-development hydrology? Because it was clear, clear from the presentation today that not everybody understands what the pre-development hydrology really was. As I understand the uh, ESA requirements is to return uh, the site uh, to the pre-development hydrology to the maximum extent technically feasible. And basically that is the same principle that the uh, MDE uses when issuing stormwater management permits. So when we were permitted originally under the original design, um, that is an implied uh, compliance with ESA at that point. We also provide then the certification that I believe you were provided a copy of from our design engineers. Likewise, when we submit the revised stormwater management plan, given the changes of configuration on the site, uh, we will issue again another certification by the current designer that we have. And when MDE issues us the permit for the stormwater management plan, uh, that basically will then connote that we've uh, done everything we can to restore the site to uh, uh, pre-development hydrology to the maximum extent technically feasible. Okay, so you have data that is submitted with that application that explains what the pre-development hydrology was and that, in fact, it, before the site was developed, that on a 25-year storm you were still going to get um, 
you know, 24,000 gallons per minute flowing through the North Stream? I mean, is that, do you have that kind of information? I cannot speak with certainty to answer that question. I, I do not know. What I do know, though, is that uh, as a part of the issuing the permit for the stormwater management plan, we, uh, the MDE basically indicates their concurrence that we are complying with. Uh, well, the okay, law. you're telling me that they approve it. You haven't told me what information is submitted. And I think there, the are, people there are, are calculations. I don't have the exact specifics, okay. but I do know that. Uh, uh, again, it satisfies the MDE requirements. Okay. So now going to another point that was made earlier, which is that the um, uh, that there should be some ongoing monitoring or um, testing to make sure that, in fact, this is happening the way it's supposed to and that you're not having uh, recurring damage um, to the adjacent parkland as a result of even this strategy. Um, is there an opportunity for corrective action in the future when, you know, if in fact we find that there is significant erosion or sedimentation that continues to occur and how might that happen if it's possible? Uh, yes, and I would say that it would be through an engagement through the site owner and that would be, presently we would say DIA is the answer to that question, but there mm -hmm. would be engagement with them as a federal agency to address any concerns that might arise in the future. Well, given the sequencing of things, is it is it conceivable that if we were to give the go-ahead for this development of the north portion of the site, that uh, if there are corrective measures that are needed, that they could be addressed in the development of the south portion of the site? Um, corrective measures within the property boundary I can speak with confidence on because that's where we can ex yeah. use the, the project resources that have been allocated. As uh, Mr. Manselman indicated, he is uh, facilitating the dialogue to address uh, those issues that uh, have occurred beyond the site um, property boundary, one of which is off of the southwest corner of the facility where there is some erosion damage. Again, mm -hmm. uh, addressing that is beyond my purview, my uh, scope of my duties. Uh, okay, so then last question I have is um, um, the commitment on uh, remediation. Can you talk to that? Or is that I mean, Mr. Manselman? Not beyond mentioned what it. Mr. Manselman spoke of earlier. Really, he's been at the forefront of that uh, that effort. Okay, maybe Mr. Manselman, if you don't mind coming back up, yes, sir. I just want to be a little bit more explicit about that. And from what I understand, we've talked about uh, remediation in the tor in in terms of a uh, uh, stream restoration and uh, some cleaning out of uh, of existing stormwater structures, and then also uh, the uh, sedimentation issue in the canal. And as I understand it, there's a commitment to pursue all of that. Yes, sir. Um, it's not been priced at this point, but that there is a, there will be an earnest effort to get all the money needed to do all of that corrective work. Uh, yes, sir. That's absolutely correct. And, and we do have we do have an initial estimate that was provided to us by the National Park Service for some of the effort, uh, mm -hmm. particularly focused on the canal. Uh, the canal is uh, the CNO canal is a little bit unique in that you have to use a fairly narrow path, which was the path for the horses pulling the, the barge down the canal. Right. Uh, so they have the unique equipment to do that. So in that case, what we've been discussing is that money would be transferred to the park service to affect uh, that cleanup. Uh, then you have uh, Mr. Berg showed you some pictures of the, of the stream beds down through and where the erosions. And again, the National Park Service uh, there were two folks that met with us. Uh, one included an engineer, one of their engineers, mm -hmm. and we talked about the, the, the different methods of improving those stream beds. In some cases, uh, you do man-made improvements to the stream beds to protect the walls from further erosion or backfill in. Uh, and then on some cases, what you do is you let nature take its course and let it naturally fill back in because the flow of the water has been significantly reduced and sometimes as they said I quote them they said sometimes man-made repairs could be worse than what the natural ones are mm -hmm. so I, I really think feel like we're moving forward on that there's there's funds in my discussions with army uh, there are funds available uh, that we can use to apply to this uh, and I've fully committed to the community that I was going to carry this through as to your your first question uh, again, we intend to be on this campus for a long time uh, to be a good neighbor, develop the site. But the work we're going to be doing is going to take the next, you know, three years, four years, frankly. 
so we'll have the chance because we'll be right there as we make the improvements on the north campus, monitor those results and make sure we're achieving the things we need to do. And if there are improvements that need to be made, we still have project funds in the out years that uh, we can apply and make improvements where necessary or add to what we've already done. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Please. Chairman, I, first of all, I, it always it doesn't surprise me, but we got a very uh, hot issue here a little, I think, in terms of environmental impact. And it sounds as though the community is really uh, fully knowledgeable about this. I mean, they've been doing a lot of work and working closely with the government, which you all seem to be doing a lot of work too. Uh, two issues, though. Uh, uh, one was uh, three issues. One, uh, we talked about resources. Uh, it's national resources, but you got a lot of tax players who are in this room too. Some of their resources are, are available and being expended on this too. So they they attack it. So they may, they have a right, I think, to to get a, a sense of transparency and, and get some of the answers addressed uh, with resources they also are putting in the kitty. Uh, two points. Uh, two other points. One delegation. I think I would be uncomfortable on the commission, given what I'm hearing. Uh, that we do uh, any 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 a delegation that might be better uh, dealt with by the full commission. Not that our executive director and staff won't do a great job, but I don't know that we should, given the sensitivities we're hearing, I'm hearing that we should do that. So uh, I would be cautious in, about delegations. Uh, lastly, the delay. I'm really encouraged by the government, you all's comments, because none of them seem to imply that there was any reason why a month delay would make any difference. Uh, and I think that if the, uh, if the community is asking that we give it some time uh, and not delegate, I think we should be sensitive to those requests. Uh, certainly I am, and I don't know whether my colleagues are or not, but we'll have to see how it goes. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Provencia. Sure. A couple of uh, comments and then just a few questions uh, toward the end. Uh, Appreciate Mr. Foles' uh, April 30th message, which was provided by the staff as part of this package. It's highly complimentary of the progress that's been made in the uh, outreach. Also, uh, compliment the Corps on the, uh, I, we were concerned about uh, as we transition to, um, away from pervious materials, uh, the, the respect and the use of uh, native species as opposed to higher maintenance and higher cost uh, turf. Also appreciate the clarification that uh, the relatively low census of 400 folks that are on the site, we were thinking about the challenges for the existing tenants as phase one and phase two progress with the interim loss of uh, surface parking as the garages are being built and then the challenge of being immediately adjacent to active construction sites as the uh, centrum and the infield building are constructed. Appreciate uh, the special efforts also to not only meet but exceed the MDE standards by several, several fold. Uh, I think on the issue of the pre-development hydrological conditions, that's probably particularly challenging unless the, the Park Service has uh, some historic documentation that would tell us what the pre-1945 site conditions uh, were at that time. Um, perhaps I can help with the, there was a concern about the initial lack of participation of the Navy in the Joint plan, uh, Traffic Committee from the folks that live at uh, the Del Car Carlia site. I can help with that. I think the, uh, the issue of the commitment and the interest and the um, uh, promise to address future erosion and sediment, both repair and prevention, are, uh, are very encouraging and uh, we're very receptive to, to that feedback. The only question I think that I have is uh, as the Joint Traffic Committee has stood up, I, th I thought I heard that Maryland uh, transportation folks were also participating. One of the troubling uh, concerns that we have is the signalization at Sangamore and Sentinel. If, the, if they are receptive, if we can plant some seeds to, we, we think uh, particularly when uh, we have peak tenants, tenancy of uh, 3,000 folks, a four-way intersection is uh, not going to serve either the, the residents or the, the occupants of that building. So we hopefully we'll continue to work with our Virginia, or excuse me, our Maryland uh, traffic planners to entertain uh, signalization. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by uh, Walt Nielsen uh, from my staff who provided uh, some of this input. Mr. Nielsen is a senior environmental planner and a LEED certified uh, uh, professional, so he has uh, and has transited the area many times, so he's familiar with the uh, with the traffic conditions. 
So I think we're headed in the right direction and uh, we want to keep up full speed and momentum. Uh, it's very impressive to me the special efforts of the planners, the DIA staff and the Corps and the partnership to uh, entertain these multiple issues from the local uh, neighborhood associations as well as the commission and still keep with uh, generally within the schedule and uh, within the budget. So I think that's uh, to be uh, to be noted and complimented about. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I, I will comment that Montgomery County DOT has been a part of the effort and been involved and, and they will certainly evaluate the uh, signalization ish, uh, question at uh, the intersection of St. Lawrence Sentinel. As we um, Thank you. As we prepare for to entertain a motion, uh, let me make some comments. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a little bit rare for me to make comments on a project. Um, I will often ask questions, but I want to make some comments on this one. First, I want to compliment the community. Um, the community has been uh, not just thoughtful, but, dog but very diligent, if not dogged, um, in their work. Their, their their constructive criticisms, their criticisms, their criticisms, their constructive criticisms, and their work with the core and the DIA. Um, it's not every day that we have folks who are engaged in a project as stakeholders, who um, actually, in addition to raising concerns, actually bring suggested uh, suggested uh, solutions. And so, uh, the community has been extraordinary, uh, in my opinion. Second. Um, Frankly, when this project came before us, it was pretty obvious that the core and the DIA um, were ham-handed, uh, were not very savvy, not very sensitive, and the early criticism um, that the owners of the project received were, in my opinion, uh, fairly justified. Third, however, um, even I have been impressed at the, um, the work the commitment that the core, the DIA, and others representing them have taken with this project. Um, and quite honestly, I th uh, as I sit here and have read all the materials over the last few days and have assessed you know, the progress that's been made, more progress has been made than honestly I would have thought. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. Um, on the PV, um, I'm satisfied personally that the core and the owner's rep will continue working to minimize um, the profile, um, and I am perfectly comfortable uh, delegating uh, these discussions to staff, um, our very expert staff, who likewise have committed um, who knows how many hours to this project and know it uh, inside out. On stormwater management, um, very early on when this project came before us, that was my chief concern, and I raised uh, quite a few um, questions about stormwater management. That's a personal area of interest and somewhat expertise uh, that I have. Um, I can say that, as I think we all know, MDE is not known for being passive on stormwater management. As has been acknowledged, they have among the most progressive uh, regulations uh, in the country. And so um, my, largely my concerns over stormwater management and the progress that's been made on that um, have been satisfied. And so last, I guess I would say this, speaking uh, purely for myself, that I hope that we will support this EDR. I am, proposed, I am uh, prepared to support the EDR, and I hope that we will, as a commission, um, kind of stop flogging this project and the uh, and the owners uh, of the project who have been working uh, pretty diligently uh, over the last number of months. So the, thems are my comments. Um, are there any others before we entertain uh, a motion? Yes, sir. Just uh, to um, one of the, well, the comments of the uh, residents and homeowners association were very uh, imp impactful. One uh, that Ms. Lurie mentioned, uh, it was particularly resonated with me about post-occupancy and, ap and after-action analysis to identify lessons learned. I think the staff does that as a routine uh, matter, of course, but I, I don't know that uh, it's done in a, in, a, in a formal way as in tracked and, and then uh, applied to, uh, to subsequent projects. And I just want to challenge Mr. Full on uh, one issue he talked about uh, 
25 year storms, perhaps only seeing two in a lifetime. Uh, some of us would like to see three or four 25 year doing our <laughs> longevity. So I just want to push back a little bit on that observation. Mr. Hart. Um, I, I, I think we've come a long way here and I applaud both the, uh, the core, the client and the community for working together to, uh, to get this far. I was a little disappointed that uh, so much structural stormwater management was included in this and I would encourage uh, in the second phase, the South Campus, to accommodate stormwater management with the environmental site design features exclusively and to avoid any structural stormwater management in the future. So uh, next time we see you, we're looking forward to some real progressive stormwater management uh, design. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, just, maybe this may be an exercise, but I'd like to uh, move that the uh, action be deferred for a month, uh, and that's a time certain, so it's debatable, and that's my first, that's the motion. It's been moved. I would second that motion. It's been moved and seconded that the um, EDR as before us uh, be deferred until um, our July meeting. Any additional discussion on that motion? Mr. Could I just hear a reiteration by the motion maker about what, what specifically we hope would be accomplished in 30 days? Well, I think the communities ask that they have more time. So, and I don't think there was anything uh, 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 persuasive that there wouldn't be, there'd be any dramatic impact if it occurred. There may be some more time spent and more resources spent, but uh, given that, that we have taxpayers asking us to do that, I think they, they may have a, uh, an opportunity to do that and, and maybe nothing will happen. But uh, dialogue doesn't hurt, and I think they've been requesting it. Every speaker from the community has. I'm just asking, maybe we go back to the speakers, but I know one of the issues was to see if they could do a better job with the solar panels. I, I just think it'd be better for us to have some specific things in mind. Well, that you see, in this, and the reason I made the motion the way I did and didn't get elaborate, I am uh, completely impressed, and it's not un uncommon. We get community groups come in here know probably a lot about these things. Mm -hmm. That anything that they want to talk about in a month is going to be talk, spoken of. And to, to give them a, a, an agenda may not be necessary. It may be constraining. So that's why I give them a month and see what can, can happen. And uh, hopefully they'll come back with some of these things dealt with and resolved. Um, I, I completely support you in that motion. Um, in a month's time, the PV um, issues should be able to be solved through a design process, um, escalated. We're not going to, we're not getting any uh, answers to um, Mr. May's question about what the consequences in delay would be. So I'd, I'd go along with that. Um, I think um, I'd go even further uh, in support of the community. I think they have been exemplar, and this is exactly what planning is supposed to be about. And um, for I don't think that it's flogging the applicant to hold their feet to the fire and ask them to be leaders in this area, um, especially in um, stormwater management. Um, there has been a, a, a lack of transparency that is regrettable. Um, and it's not a punishment. It's it's simply being diligent and asking that they respond to the community's very articulate and uh, deliberate requests. So um, I would support your motion. I don't. I haven't heard that a month will be catastrophic to this to the uh, outcome, and it seems uh, a reasonable request on on several fronts. Further discussion. Am, uh, unreal and at this point remain unconvinced that uh, there is a direct benefit to be derived by delaying uh, 30 days. It, the, it, a couple of the major concerns that were raised today had to do with the photovoltaics that was addressed and there'll be several uh, options were, uh, were presented that'll be further evaluated. Um, on the stormwater management, uh, some of the, well, some of the folks did not have expertise. I was very impressed with the credentials of uh, Dr. Zizel, uh, as well as his uh, personal interest being a, a resident and a, and a member of one of the 
homeowners association, so clearly there's some subject matter expertise, highly qualified individual expertise available to the homeowners groups. Um, also, the uh, there appear to be multiple forums. Uh, traffic is just uh, one of many of those. Uh, there has been uh, demonstrated since last fall uh, um, both uh, the, the words as well as the actions and the follow-up and the follow-through by both the core and the DIA planners to be receptive and to address the uh, issues raised by the both the uh, regulatory agencies as well as the homeowner. So my position is uh, to uh, to proceed uh, and to support the recommendations as uh, presented by the staff. Okay, is there further discussion? Do we, so is, do, is the motion that's on the table inclusive of the, of the uh, case study, the, the post occupancy or whatever we're calling it, the post op report? Because I think that's a really important, um, Ms. Lurie's request I think is a really uh, important thing to include. Did, is it on the, is it included in your, in the motion that's on the table? Maybe I'm having a little trouble, but my only motion is simple delay for a month and that's it yeah. and let's see what the community and the government can do hopefully they can do a lot of wonderful things between now and then that's all I'm asking for Mr. Goni I'm very sympathetic to the motion um, that's been made um, I just don't want to necessarily leave it that we hear this entire presentation right. again in a month <laughs> with all the people right. who spent the time to come here, come again in a month and do this all over again. So that's why I'm really searching desperately for um, some other way to narrow this. Um, I've heard uh, uh, the community ask that we not delegate to the ED the approval of the final site development. So I'm wondering if we look at the recommendation and the approval right now has several exceptions, including the final site development plans for landscape, hardscape, furniture, site security. What if we added photovoltaics mm -hmm. to that and specifics of the stormwater management system? And then that would have to come back. Those seem to be more or less the issues that were the contentious issues. Um, and then we would hear a narrower set of things uh, for the next uh, for the next go around, so it's not a formal amendment yet, but I'm looking at the. Mr. Chairman, I would be open to anything that would be considered a friendly and constructive amendment. But what I would like to ask, if I could, whether one of the community people might want to comment on this. I saw some indications, and I think that's a fair thing. Uh, I don't know the gentleman's name, but please, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. We need to move along. Yes, I'm Steve Salop. I, I, I think what we would like to be done in a month is that for the Corps to document its claim that there will be no potential erosion problem. What We'd like to know what documentation they have to establish that rather than just relying on, rather than just trusting them. Uh, Mr. Olson has suggested that they've already done the analysis and that while he simultaneously seemed to be suggesting they can't do the analysis, I'd like to know what analysis they've done and so that we can see, so that everyone could see, the NPS in particular, Dr. Zizel as well, whether the documentation um, is sufficient to conclude that there's no significant erosion problem, sedimentation problem. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to stay with my motion. I will be willing to, you know, if there's another motion, fine. Uh, I mean, in my different lives, uh, in the military, retired colonel, and in, the, in a lot of other roles, and run a business for 25 years, I learned that micromanagement is very dangerous, particularly when you're dealing with people who are very smart. Uh, and hopefully, they will come to closure in, in a sensible manner, given the opportunity and other roles. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. The motion, as before, is simply to delay for one month. Second. It's, it's been it's been moved and seconded. Uh, I don't know personally that we need to get into the nitty-gritty. I think Mr. Um, Mr. Olson and Mr. Uh, Manselman have heard the requests and you will nod your head that you will work with the to provide transparency, right, Mr. Mansel, Mansel, yes, sir. Manselman? So um, without any further comment, but sensing a divided vote, those in favor of the motion to delay for one month will raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
And those opposed? One, two, three. So the motion carries on a vote of seven to three to delay for one month. Uh, we will see you here in July. Agenda item number 5B is the comprehensive plan for the National Capital Federal Element amendments to the Federal Transportation Element. And we have Mr. Zayden. If, Mr. Zayden, if you will hold up for just a moment while people exit quietly. Mr. Zayden, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, your next agenda item is a, the final policy adoption for the transportation element for the federal element of the comprehensive plan. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the substance of these, uh, these policies, but I also want to give a little background on uh, the project itself and, and the process that we're using to update, update the comprehensive plan. So. Uh, just a little bit of background. I know uh, many members of the commission are, are, are familiar with this, but the comprehensive plan for the national capital is divided into two components, uh, the federal elements and the district elements. Uh, NCPC is responsible for the federal elements and the District of Columbia is responsible for the district elements. Um, and they are meant to work hand in hand and be coordinated. Uh, the district elements were recently uh, updated um, in 2011 and the, uh, the updated uh, district elements were actually just published uh, on the web and everything, so that's, that update is complete. We began our update in 2010, and we have been working over the last couple of years to get the policies together, and through the rest of this year, we plan on, on bringing those policies to you uh, for the full update. So why are we updating the federal elements? Um, there should be a periodic evaluation of the policies in the comprehensive plan, and these policies are meant as goal statements uh, that guide decision making for, uh, for federal agencies and uh, particularly the commission in reviewing projects. Um, also, since the last update of the federal elements, which was in 2004, there has been a tremendous amount of work in sustainability. Uh, there is the uh, executive order, uh, which is the federal leadership in environmental energy and economic performance. This is commonly known as the sustainability executive order. This has really changed the uh, the view of, or I'm sorry, the the the, uh, the progress of the administration and federal agencies in achieving sustainability. And we wanted to make sure the comprehensive plan uh, reflected these goals. Also, we want to add a new urban design element. Uh, the federal elements as they stand today do not have an urban design uh, element which focuses on urban design policies. The district elements have such an urban design uh, component and we have convened the urban design task force which uh, many of the, the commissioners are members of um, which has been meeting over the last year to construct this urban design element and there's actually a meeting of the group next Tuesday and we hope to bring a draft of that urban design element to the commission in the fall. Okay, so to talk a little bit about the adoption process, and this applies to the existing elements and how we're going about updating those policies. Essentially, we work internally to develop policy updates, take them to our stakeholder groups, which uh, consists of uh, many of the agencies on the commission and beyond, and then bring the draft elements uh, to the commission for public comment, uh, to be released for public comment. Um, and then uh, once that public comment uh, period has closed and we've updated the elements, we want to bring the policies to the commission for final adoption, which is what we're asking for today uh, for the transportation element. However, the comprehensive plan is, uh, is a big animal. There's a, there's a lot in it. Uh, there's a lot of policies and information that, contain, that are contained in each element. And it would be uh, quite a bit for the commission to look at all at once, uh, particularly the public. So what we're asking for is that each element, as the policies are updated, be adopted but then held in abeyance um, and not put into effect until the entire comprehensive plan has been put together and compiled and, and published. So um, this will also eliminate any confusion among applicant agencies um, as this update is moving forward. 
uh, as to what elements are up to date in from the 2004 plan and what are in effect today. So. Um, essentially, the policies that are before you in the transportation element, uh, if you so approve them today, will be held in abeyance uh, and not put into effect until the entire document and comprehensive plan is put together. And we anticipate that to happen in February of 2013. This is very similar to how the district's been uh, updating their, their zoning code as well, just kind of piece by piece and then putting it all to, with the intention of putting it all together at the end. Okay, so very briefly, where are we with, with each element? Uh, the transportation element is before you today for policy adoption. Uh, the workplace element has already been released, as you may recall, for public comment. That went out at the same time as the transportation element. However, the workplace element is so broad, we're still kind of gathering data and drafting narratives, which are part of the elements. Um, and we hope to bring this to you at the September meeting. Uh, the environmental element um, was on your uh, consent calendar for today to be released for public comment um, that was approved and so that will go out for a 60-day comment period uh, we also will be holding a public meeting uh, on that element and i'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second we have begun updating the visitor element we recently held a stakeholder forum to talk about policy ideas for that element and we hope to bring that for uh, public comment to the commission uh, later or early in early fall uh, the new urban design element, which is kind of on a separate track because it's a brand new element, um, uh, is ongoing. Uh, we are meeting with the Urban Design Task Force, as I mentioned on Tuesday, to begin our, our to continue our discussions on policy ideas, and we will be spending the summer uh, drafting a uh, a draft element. Um, and the tricky thing with the urban design element is there are so many policies that are, exist in the parks and open space element as well as the historic preservation element that we really can't update those until we get to this urban design process. So the intention is to package all that up once it's ready and bring it to the commission uh, for draft release in the fall. Uh, the foreign missions element, uh, we are just uh, beginning to look at this and this will be the last element we'll update uh, before we complete the entire uh, comp plan update in 2013. So. Just an update there. Okay, to talk about the, the federal environment element real quick. Uh, again, this was on your consent calendar to be released for public comment. Uh, the main focus of our update uh, revolves around climate change and energy conservation. These were two areas that were not included uh, in the 2004 element, and we think it's they're, they're ripe to be included now. So you'll see a set of draft policies in the environment element. Um, the 60-day public comment period will run from June 11th to August 10th. Uh, we will be holding a public meeting here at NCPC on June 27th uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. just to basically present the draft to the public and take comments at that time. Uh, in any event, we will accept public comments uh, not only from the public but from agencies as well uh, all the way up through the, the comment period and those can be um, uh, uh, access to us through the uh, website which we have up which is ncpc.gov backslash comp plan um, so uh, that is out for public comment to talk very briefly about the transportation element because a lot of this has already been presented to you uh, uh, in the in the meeting where we released it for draft the original transportation element was added in 2004 which was the last update of the comprehensive plan it emphasizes choice and transportation options it provides policy recommendations on transit infrastructure management and design uh, but the real focus is to manage how the federal government commutes to work that's that's a, a really sizable chunk of the transportation element because the impacts are so great uh, being the largest employer in the national capital region um, as the other policies in the in the comprehensive plan the transportation element creates standards and goals for federal facilities and that's really the point of these policies is to uh, point applicants in the right direction and to create standards by which their projects can be evaluated um, one of the ways we look at the policies is to look at data and trends and uh, one of the, the big chunks that we looked at uh, was how the federal government and federal employees are commuting to work and we started by looking at the uh, uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Household Commuter Survey, which uh, surveyed, which has a lot of great data, and it really focuses and it separates out federal employees, which is incredibly helpful. Um, but it looks at how how employees within the region are commuting to work. And the last survey was published in 2009, and that included data up through 2008. 
Um, so we use this as a way to look at trends in federal commuting, and essentially they're pretty good. Federal employees are driving alone um, less than they were in 1994, which was the previous survey. They're using transit more. Uh, walking and biking are starting to become uh, recognizable forms of commuting to work. And in comparing those no federal numbers with the rest of the region, federal employees are doing well in comparison. Um, for instance, 54% of the federal government, according to the survey, are driving alone to work as comparison to 73% of employees in the region. Uh, transit is, is likewise. Federal employees, 33% uh, of, the, of the federal workforce is using transit to commute to work, whereas 13% uh, of the region is using transit. So we really use these as, as a guide uh, as a, to show trends in federal commuting. Uh, COG is beginning to uh, gear up to do this survey again, um, and we'll be looking to get those numbers, and if we can, incorporate those in the comp plan for this update, if not for the next one. <clears throat> okay, so just to give a, an overview of the policies, uh, one area that we particularly focused on was on transportation management plans. Um, the commission requires master plans, including TMPs for installations of 100 employees or more. And the draft policy updates encourage TMPs to look at the range of alternatives beyond single occupancy vehicles as a means of commuting, including telework and flexible schedules. The goal here is to mitigate transportation impacts of federal facilities. Um, an additional policy that we added uh, reflected uh, the need to look at mitigation measures when a facility may cause adjacent affected corridors to fail. This is basically an aspirational policy to guide federal agencies to look beyond the boundaries of their site when understanding the transpor transportation impacts that they're having and develop measures to mitigate those impacts if they are indeed negative. Um, the TMPs need to look at implementation strategies with timetables. And it reiterates the need for TMPs to be updated every two years. And this is basically a goal for federal agencies to understand the nature and the changes in their federal facilities every two years to see if they need to update their, uh, their transportation strategies. We have also added a section on active commuting and bicycling. Um, a, a lot of these policies stem from the work that the Council of Environmental Quality has done uh, in implementing the Sustainability Executive Order. And essentially, it is uh, a new method to encourage uh, federal employees in the federal government to use uh, active commuting as a means of getting to work. This includes such a thing as things as bike, bicycling or walking or any other physical method. Uh, the draft policy updates encourage federal facilities to meet the standards of local jurisdictions in providing bicycle and active commuting facilities. Uh, one of the things that we discovered in doing our work is that a lot of the communities around the national capital region are updating their standards for bicycle racks and bicycle facilities. Um, and also requiring more bicycling networks. And we think the federal agencies should try to meet those standards in developing their facilities. We are also encouraging the use of bicycle sharing programs. Uh, things such as Capital Bike Share have become extremely popular um, and federal agencies should, should support their use. As well as integrating their facilities within the local transportation, I'm sorry, bicycling network as communities develop more trails uh, and bicycle roadways. So um, we think this all will encourage more active commuting among the, the federal workforce. Uh, one area that we spend a lot of time in discussion internally and with our stakeholders is our parking ratios. As a lot of you know, these are essentially our parking uh, goals for federal facilities that are broken down by geography throughout the region. Um, the the uh, stricter area is within the core, which we call the central employment area, where, as an example, federal facilities can only have one space per every five employees, and those ratios relax as you go farther away from, this, from the core, which is essentially the hub of the metro network. Uh, we did a comparison of how these ratios uh, uh, hold up against parking requirements in other communities, and we thought that they performed pretty well, so we have not changed the ratios. Um, one of the things that we have added is the need for facilities out in the region to understand what new uh, transit services may be coming online that may uh, uh, impact how their employees get to work. And if it is such a capacity um, that compares to the metro rail system, and this could be something like MARC or VRE or even streetcar, um, then they should adjust their, their, uh, their parking facilities in, uh, accordingly. So that was the only change we made with the parking ratios. 
So uh, beyond uh, this, uh, this policy adoption, um, we have received public comments from private citizens and the DC Downtown Business Improvement District. Those comments are listed verbatim in your EDR along with our responses. Uh, they basically um, resulted in some, some good tweaks to our language to make them clearer. Um, and we will be working to refine the narrative, which is the supporting text to the policies as this moves forward. Uh, and then we'll compile all of these elements in the same manner and look to bring uh, the comp plan updated to you in February of 2013. Uh, so the executive director's re recommendation is as follows. Uh, the commission should uh, final adopt, I'm sorry, uh, the commission action uh, is the final adoption of the adopted policies to the federal transportation element, but to hold those policies in abeyance until all of the federal elements of the comprehensive plan uh, have been adopted and at which time we can, we can uh, uh, publish the full document. So, uh, that concludes my presentation and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zayden, very much. Uh, and I want to reiterate what you said about the public comments. Uh, many of the public comments were terrific. Uh, mm -hmm. They were insightful and they helped us clarify. We addressed them where we could and some uh, suggestions were simply beyond our uh, scope or jurisdiction, but nevertheless, good comments. Sure, I, would, Mr. I, would move, I would move, I would like to comment though after I move, move the uh, recommendation, please. It's been moved and seconded. Um, the EDR, is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I just would like uh, maybe some questions about uh, slides 9 and 10. I'm curious about the carpooling. Uh, I didn't, didn't notice the, the... Are these these are the charts, I'm sorry? Yeah, 9 and 10. Am I, and that chart's not necessary, but I guess I'm just hopeful that we can develop. I know there's some efforts to develop um, strategies within the government agencies mm -hmm. to facilitate carpooling right I know they're web-based or what how they are done mm -hmm. but it just seems to me that the carpooling if we're going to people are going to ride the real big number on the left driving alone is just I mean that's just very very complicated mm -hmm. and and along with some type of I don't know this I'm sharing this as a part of the discussion as we listen to the community uh, uh, part of this is also all offering alternatives when someone can't make the carpool you know some strategies to encourage the carpooling. Mm -hmm. uh, the other concern I have has to do with biking, which I'm very, I, I wish I had more energy and time to do more of it, <laughs> but uh, people are, and that's wonderful. But we still have the problem with credit card usage of bikes within the shared biking system. Has that been done? Maybe it has been, oh good. <laughs> I'm behind the time. Yeah. It, some, some ideas, good. But I won't, won't, I won't spend time, it's wonderful. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that as these bikes that we have now that at least are getting older, maybe there's a way they can be modified or whatever and then cycle back into the community in a way so those who can't afford to rent them from the things can have their own and enable us to ride and be part of the team. But that's my, those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Just Mr. Gunn. Um, TMPs are required for our... our I, is that a suggestion or a requirement? I mean, I guess all of these things are kind of mm -hmm. policies. Right. The, the, the TMPs are, are, the requirement for TMPs is actually in our submission guidelines. So the, the comp plan kind of reiterates some of the submission guidelines, but um, the requirement is, the strict requirement is, is in the submission guidelines. So, Mr. Zayden, this might just be a fun thing for you to be able to do kind of on an ongoing basis, but one of the things that's certainly obvious is that the region is only gathering this data about mm -hmm. commute patterns mm -hmm. very episodically. 1994, then 2008, it's kind of a long stretch of time right. given how quickly different transportation options are coming online. I'm just wondering if you, if you're requiring uh, TMPs for submissions and that might include some existing mode splits that agencies would be able to determine through surveys of their employees, maybe there's a way to begin to aggregate that data um, or at least report that data so that you might be the canary in the coal mine, that, that you might have some of the first data to show uh, additional shifts in transportation behavior mm -hmm. and mode choice because, the you know, doing a regional survey every 12 or 14 years seems like, you know, we're flying blind right. for a lot of the time. So I don't know how you do that, but I would just suggest okay. if this is something that's a requirement in the submission, there might be something useful to be more broadly learned. Um, if, uh, if that information was to be aggregated and occasionally shared and reported. Right. Thank you. I know there's some similar requirements in our submission guidelines, but we can, we can work on that. 
Ms. Provencia. A couple of comments. I think this is a, a, a wonderful initiative for the staff to take on. Appreciate uh, removing that requirement about uh, two-year updates. That was uh, onerous and uh, burdensome, I think, to the facilities in the National Capital Region. A couple of concerns about just a, a few things. Uh, in Section E that has to do with active commuting, and there's a requirement that installations that have uh, secure perimeters have to uh, connect with nearby trails. That's also uh, somewhat burdensome. I can think of a couple of three examples. Uh, St. Elizabeth's will be in that situation once they have a perimeter fence up. I don't know the, the trail network in that area. NIH is, is already a, a facility that uh, that has, unfortunately, a perimeter fence. The open campus is uh, is behind us. The uh, National Naval Medical Center across the street, uh, Pentagon, it's, it's ma making that a requirement requires uh, additional security gates and additional security personnel, screening and so forth, and, and uh, is, uh, is uh, challenging. Um, it might be a heresy, but uh, perhaps the 2,000-foot uh, standard could be revisited. That was standard, I think, based on our research, uh, was created in 1983. And here we are almost 30 years later. Uh, the purview, the scope of the National Capital Planning Commission has expanded into things like uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. And if you will, uh, one observation is the, the health of our citizenry has a direct impact on the economics of the area. Uh, many things have changed. You talked about um, the requirement to uh, revisit and revalidate um, guidelines that are in place, uh, po multiple, you, you cited several of the policy changes that uh, have occurred, the, the legislative acts as well as uh, uh, a plethora of executive orders. The, there's some uh, health claims that says if people walk 20 to 30 minutes a day, uh, a 2,000 a foot travel is around 10 minutes or so of walking. Perhaps if, the, uh, if that standard was increased, say, to half a mile, mm -hmm. 2,600 feet, that's at least a, a 15 minute. What I'm thinking about is explosion in obesity and all of the conditions related to that, diabetes and arthrosclerosis and on and on and on. If, if part of our purview actually is economic development and to include uh, the adverse impact of the declining health of our nation, that, uh, that standard might uh, also be re-looked re at. There's some narrative in, the, in Section H, uh, Paragraph 1, about called uh, Fix It First on page 36. But what we're seeing is um, I hate to single out Metro as an example of, uh, of lack of maintenance, but uh, it appears that with the frequent F elevator and escalator outages, the, the minimal uh, cleaning. Um, we also see uh, throughout the city, uh, s snow removal is a good example. We encourage people to walk and to hike and, and to, to bike to work, but as soon as we have uh, snow events, we pile up the sidewalks and force pedestrians and bikers into the streets to compete with the traffic and the snow removal equipment. So one other thing that seems to be a little bit out of kilter is the uh, Mass Transit, Transit Benefit Program as it's currently constructed. Mm. For example, when the uh, subsidy is $240 a month for parking and it's only $125 for mass transit and $20 a month for commuting, it appears that the incentive, the, the, beha the behavior we're trying to incentivize is parking. Mm -hmm. Therefore, driving as opposed to mass transit. When the when the combination of um, mass transit and biking is only equivalent to parking as opposed to the reverse being true, it seems like we're sending sending mixed signals. Uh, DoD is proud to have a pretty robust uh, mass transit benefit program. We have about seventy thousand folks in the D.C. area that are not on military installations, and almost half of them participate in mass transit. Our, our program is eight times the, the largest, uh, the next largest competitor, and we distribute more than $50 million in benefits a year, and it is paying off, and the, the numbers are showing that. Um, uh, last couple of comments. I'm not sure that uh, I don't see s at, at the current time in this version references to things like uh, slug. It, it may be buried within the carpool, but but slugging is an is a very active program. I'm just amazed at how it works and how right. grassroots it is. And as far as I know, nobody's been killed, and 
people don't disappear every day. <laughs> I used to say that about bike share, and then I heard about the bikes being used to commit crimes and so forth. But you, we are, and, and you talking about the, the uh, and talking about the the, the Not bad. kind of the creation of the document, we were talking about ha make, having photos of people slugging at some point. Some NCPC employees do that, so we're going to follow them out to their. Last their observation is about some new technology, robotic uh, parking garages. I don't see language in this current uh, version. It appears that this uh, technology is proliferating. There's, uh, we see it in uh, the Tom Cruise movies. Um, <laughs> as a scene of, uh, of uh, when you can fight your opponents, but it's proliferating uh, uh, into uh, Europe. The Porsche group has some expertise. Uh, there's uh, two or three, uh, as I'm, based on our research, uh, automated parking garages in New York. There's some in New Jersey. There's some in the planning stages in, at several locations in Florida. The preliminary numbers that I'm seeing are, are very encouraging. Uh, two to three times more cars in the same footprint, um, costs uh, per space of twenty to $25,000 based on roughly 100 spaces versus conventional parking of eighteen dollars to $40,000 a space in a standard 100, square, 100 space garage, um, constrained uh, uh, pallet sizes as opposed to conventional parking uh, spaces. Uh, some of these operations are completely automated. There's not even parking attendants. There's a one and a half minute retrieval from the time you go to retrieve your vehicle. So things like uh, um, exiting capacity is, uh, it seems to have been addressed. Um, redundant uh, servers in case you have a server failure for the, for the primary. Um, in, in steadily improving uh, technologies. Uh, some have multiple entry and retrieval points. Some have a single and, and so forth. So. I would encourage us to, to think creatively in the future when robotic garages are, are, are cost affordable, um, cost effective, as well as even uh, commuting by uh, personal airplanes and helicopter operations, whatever that hybrid model will look like in the future. Just need to be prepared, I think, for, for technologies that are <clears throat> presently already here in other parts of the world and will hopefully arrive in the, on our shores as in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Provencio. Yes, Mr. Wells. Thank you very much. Could you um, define a little bit better for me what subsidized parking is? Is it subsidized that it's, um, is it based on market rate that parking is offered below market rate or is it subsidized by the fact that um, you provided some money for it or something? How, how's that defined? Um, well, for the, for the purposes of the comp plan, it's basically um, anything that may may encourage either financially or behavioral wise somebody to drive to work so actually free parking is subsidized parking sure but what about um downtown parking has a certain cost to it we have a federal building next door to um a place well i know in the reagan building it's around 16 dollars an hour mm -hmm. that's the market rate there so it's subsidized based upon the anything lower than market rate i think that would fall within the definition so is that clear in the policy? Um, if it's not, we'll make it clear in the narrative that that should okay. be stated. Thank you I mean, much. essentially, the overall goal is to have no encouragement of somebody, of federal employees driving to work in a single occupancy vehicle when, when they don't need to, when there might be other options, um, and that they that, that expense be borne uh, market-wise, not underneath. <coughs> Thank you. And then I, I do strongly support the development of continuous system multi-use trails and hikers from, and bikers in the region. I was very impressed that the Navy Yard, mm -hmm. you know, one of the most secure areas in the city, was able to continue the, the hiking and biking trail, which certainly benefits their employees as well so that they can um, hike or walk during their, their periods so that they can get exercise as well. So I, I do support that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Mr. Goni. One last comment, and this has come up several times, and I think we're going to hear a presentation immediately after this about the new FEMA uh, building and the master plan. So there's a section of this um, uh, of this new transportation policy that deals with parking, mm -hmm. policy section D, where you actually give some guidance about the structures themselves. Mm -hmm. but, I, but as I see it, you're silent about whether or not the structures are inside or outside the security barriers. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it would be helpful to give guidance to applicants about 
uh, how much how preferable it is as we're going to see in the FEMA example I hope um, that where possible we put those parking structures outside the security barriers because there's just no reason for us to be paying to secure automobiles mm -hmm. uh, at the exclusion you know when we're really concerned about the personnel um, and so I, I think that's worth you know making a statement about as a policy obviously every uh, federal uh, facility for every um, individual project will weigh their own security concerns but I think we've had enough discussion about this on the Commission that it's worth taking this opportunity to tar articulate our strong preference okay. yeah and like, like a lot of things in the complaint there are overlapping elements and I think we can also tackle some of that in the urban design element. and we can be sure right to put it in the urban design element mm -hmm. too as well. yeah. uh, just you know overkill never hurt anyone on that issue I agree completely Ms. Greenwald I would just ask that if we do indicate a preference about where the parking is with relation to the secure zone, that we do highlight, as, as Harriet said, that there are security issues that mm -hmm. will, you know, making sure that the applicant takes in those security issues, discusses it with FPS, you know, makes a decision and not just goes with the baseline preference. Thanks. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah, in, in the in, in the area of encouraging people to use public transit, I think we should try to encourage uh, the Washington Nationals to, to work with Metro uh, so as to uh, provide uh, Metro service uh, after normal service ends mm -hmm. so that thousands of, uh, uh, of customers at Nationals Ballpark uh, aren't inconvenienced as they were Tuesday night uh, when uh, this, I was there. Uh, I stuck it out. I never leave. Uh, and he, when when the sign went up at the Nationals Ballpark around 11 o'clock, said the last train leaves at 11:20. You feel like you're in the middle of uh, you know Dodge City. The stagecoach is leaving. You better get on it. And uh, of course, thousands of people got up and 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 left. And and those that that didn't, uh, and I was one of them, <laughs> were were left to uh, try to grab any taxi you could. So I think that the expectation would be, say a game starts at 8.30 on a Sunday night or there are rain delays and so on, that uh, people would be less inclined to, to use public transportation and would be more inclined to do whatever they could to either uh, drive to the ballpark or make other arrangements along those lines. So it just seems to me that I know there was an arrangement in previous years where uh, the city and its budget would provide for those circumstances, but the city doesn't have the money in its budget now for understandable reasons. And it just uh, seems to me that uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the overall benefits that are provided uh, to the Nationals, uh, free ballpark to start with, uh, that uh, uh, someone should be encouraging them to, uh, uh, to allow people, to permit people to basically pay whatever it is, $20,000 an hour or whatever the case may be, uh, so that people are not stranded at the ballpark and hustling around uh, uh, the Navy Yard area close to midnight uh, because the trains aren't operating. Mr. Dennis is still peeved. <laughs> <laughs> I, got a ta I, got, I didn't get the last train, but I got the last taxi, I think. <laughs> Aren't there currently provisions for, for WMATA? I know uh, for, there were for special events holders so that the city doesn't have to bear the entire yeah. burden of that uh, ex extra cost. Uh, I'm thinking the Suman, Susan G. Komen race that had early trains. Those are subsidized, I think, partially, if not completely, by the event sponsors. If Mr. Costa, who yeah, wears I'm, a different hat, might. Uh, I, I feel like I'm at a WMATA board meeting right now. But, uh, <laughs> But actually, you raise a good point, but I think this is an issue that's been ongoing between the Nationals and WMATA in terms of, um, you know, providing service to the Nationals game, but I can certainly follow up with them. It's only because we're talking about encouraging use of public transportation. Right, right. And I think everybody would like to see that, but I do think it is a contractual issue uh, between the two parties at this point. And I'll follow up. It just, it just looks bad does. to have a sign go up. The last train leaves at 1120. Mm -hmm. If uh, the people didn't leave, they could have uh, spent $20,000 buying hot dogs and food, and, and so uh, the team would have received a benefit from that, and 
I just, uh, I, I think it would be uh, uh, good public policy. Sounds like a case where there's a policy and a procedure in place, but it's pr perhaps not being uh, implemented. Speaking of policies, I think some of the more progressive cities in the U.S. include uh, cities like Portland and Seattle, where in the central business core, it's, uh, it's free transportation. And the effect there is it encouraged folks to use it. Uh, uh, bicycles, for example, can be brought onto the, uh, the trains at any time, unlike D.C., where you have to pay and you're prohibited during those, uh, those peak periods. So again, we're, wh which behavior are we uh, incentivizing and uh, in rewarding? Perhaps policies like that could be revisited. Mr. Provencia, do you have a motion on the EDR? Motion to approve, sir. It's been moved. Is there a second? It's second. been seconded. Oh, we are, we've already done that. Okay. It's been so long. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, sensing no further discussion, um, all in favor of the EDR as before us say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zayden. Very good presentation. Terrific discussion. Um, agenda item number 5C is the Department of Homeland Security Headquarters Consolidation at St. Elizabeth's. This is a master plan amendment for the Federal Emergency Management Agency Headquarters and Transportation Improvements. And we have Mr. Hart. And as we're preparing, I noticed that since the master plan has been approved several years ago, uh, we've had come before us a number of significant projects on this overall very significant project. Um, we've had the U.S. Coast Guard Headquarters in the garage. We've had part of the West Campus uh, Access Road, and we've had a number of the adaptive reuse projects and a lot of utility work. So we've made a lot of progress uh, to date and this is the next big one that's uh, coming before us uh, for this amendment. Mr. Hart, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. The project that's uh, before you today, as the chairman just noted, is the master plan amendment for the Federal Emergency Management Agency headquarters and uh, as well as some transportation improvements that are associated with that. This is uh, the Department of Homeland Security Cons Consolidated Headquarters at St. Elizabeth's. Um, and it's su submitted by the General Services Administration um, for master plan, and it, it, in, it is a master plan modification. And what I'll be doing today is uh, giving an uh, overview of the project um, and uh, be available for answering questions. Um, GSA is also here as well, um, as, as well as DHS to uh, answer questions that you may have. So uh, the St. Elizabeth's campus um, is shown here. It is a National Historic Landmark. Um, the uh, campus itself is, is made up of two elements. There's the uh, West Campus, which is a federal, uh, uh, federal, under federal ownership, and an East Campus, which is um, owned by the District of Columbia. Um, and in 2009, the commission approved the final master plan for the DHS um, consolidation at San Elizabeth and noted that further study was uh, um, required for a few elements. Um, at the time, further analysis um, was requested for the FEMA headquarters, which is located on the um, east campus, um, because the uh, decision for the FEMA headquarters um, came late into the planning process. In addition, the commission required transportation improvements to be further studied um, as um, all the impacts were not identified uh, at that time. This proposal that GSA has submitted is a culmination of this uh, multi-year effort. Um, to orient you, uh, this is 295, which is to the west of the, uh, the campus. Um, of course, the campus is here. Uh, Suitland Parkway is to the north. Malcolm X uh, Avenue is to the south. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue is uh, bisecting the two campuses. Um, now, uh, sorry for the uh, image, but it, this is actually rotated, so the north is on the left-hand portion of the slide. Um, and uh, this is, image is showing some major functional relationships at the St. Elizabeth campus. First, with the uh, east campus, um, here is the, uh, the future mixed-use development uh, that DC has been planning for, um, for several years. Also included here are the St. Elizabeth Hospital as well as the DC, United, uh, DC Unified Communications Center. Um, since the 2008 uh, master plan was developed, the district has continued <coughs> developing uh, their mixed-use portion um, of the campus and, um, has, uh, and GSA and, and the district have negotiated with uh, each other about the federal use parcel which is shown here um, on the East Campus. 
Um, while GSA has been coordinating with DC on this, um, on this development, continued coordination with the district um, on its plans for the rest of the, uh, the, the campus is vitally important for both organizations. D uh, GSA states in its submittal that the DHS consolidation is a phase development that will um, currently scheduled to be completed within eight years. Um, construction on site is ongoing with the US Coast Guard headquarters um, construction being built here as well as the parking garage that's uh, to the south of it. Um, some of the campus amenities are being constructed, as well as campus utilities, um, and uh, as the chairman noted as well, the uh, um, a portion of the West Campus Access Road, um, the northern portion of it, which is on Saint, uh, the West Campus, and then a portion of um, uh, Firth Sterling um, intersection. The other phases of the West Campus will be uh, developed uh, at our, at, in the later phases. So um, here is the um, master plan amendment, um, and it's primarily focused, as I said earlier, on the FEMA headquarters as well as uh, transportation improvements. The image here shows the FEMA development in the center with the East Campus um, uh, development as uh, DC is currently showing it. This is a, uh, an image from uh, December of 2011. Um, in addition, there are the, um, uh, the full extent of the transportation um, uh, improvements. Uh, this is Martin Luther King Avenue here. Uh, so the improvements would begin here, which is south of Malcolm X, and um, and basically go along uh, all the way to the uh, the edge of the uh, where the campuses are. Um, for the Shepherd Parkway, uh, the West Campus Access Road improvements that we're talking about um, are the portion that is in Shepherd's Parkway. Um, Shepherd's Parkway is a green National Park Service property um, that's, that's outlined here in uh, in green. <laughs> and um, again, as I said, the northern portion of this um, was approved by the commission uh, last year. I'd, uh, I'd also like to note uh, the two metro stations. There's a Congress Heights metro station to the south and the uh, Anacostia station, which is to the north. Uh, these are important given that um, a, um, a percentage, a large percentage of the, uh, of the, of the employees that are coming to the, uh, both the West Campus and the FEMA site um, will be arriving um, by uh, transit and there are uh, shuttles planned to connect the, uh, the, the metro stations with the campuses, um, excuse me, to, uh, to allow DHS to, to reach the uh, one space per four employee um, parking ratio that's uh, stipulated by um, NCPC. Now, um, in the last slide, I showed all of the components included in the master plan modification. Now I'd like to discuss the uh, federal use parcel on the uh, East Campus in a little bit uh, greater detail. This slide is a, um, a bird's eye view of the East um, and, which is here, the West Campus, as well as the city in the, in the background. Um, the East Campus, uh, the FEMA uh, portion is actually highlighted here in yellow. While some of the, uh, the, the work and the drawing here looks fairly detailed, um, the designs depicted here are for illustrative purposes only. The actual designs will need to be developed further and will be submitted to the commission in the future. This image included here shows several multi-story um, masses for the, uh, for the FEMA building. And um, you'll note that uh, the massing here, this is along ML, excuse me, MLK uh, Avenue. The massing here, um, is the, this building is actually a little bit shorter than the buildings that are uh, located toward the, uh, toward the rear of the site. Um, and also note that the parking garage is, uh, is located here um, toward the rear of the site as well. And finally, um, GSA has also uh, included some of the massing um, for some of the new uh, development at the East Campus um, as well to show uh, as comparison to the FEMA building. This is an image showing the um, massing for the FEMA headquarters. Uh, this is along uh, Martin Luther King Junior Avenue and um, uh, Pecan Street, uh, which is a new street that will, uh, it, it, the street is existing, it will be um, improved as part of this project as well. Um, I'll note that uh, this building, uh, the massing looks fairly flat or even here. Um, I'll note that the, uh, the, the topography uh, of, the, uh, of the property actually slopes down away from MLK. So the massing here, these are act this is actually a nine-story mass, and this is a four-story mass. Um, so the topography helps to um, 
uh, helps to deal with that massing so it doesn't seem as, as um, overly tall. Now, um, as requested by the Commission in 2009, GSA provided additional analysis um, and some of the topic areas uh, that were um, uh, studied are indicated, indicated on this slide. This drawing also shows the existing conditions and buildings on the site, um, the uh, Dix Pavilion as well as a building that is the uh, DC Human Services uh, building, it's a, um, I think a veterans uh, shelter. Um, and they will be actually demolished as, as part of the, uh, the FEMA headquarter um, construction. Um, through the analysis um, that, conduct, that, that GSA conducted, um, they identified a buildable area, which is this area here outlined in uh, the shaded in red um, for the uh, FEMA headquarters building. This location was chosen because it minimized impacts to nearby land uses, um, also minimized uh, impacts to historic resources, natural resources, and uh, also mi uh, minimized impacts to, uh, to views. GSA used three development alternatives in its um, EIS for the master plan amendment, and um, they used this buildable area outlined in red as the um, footprint, the buildable area for the, uh, for the FEMA headquarters. Now, um, getting to the um, preferred alternative, this is the preferred alternative from, uh, for the, that was used in the, um, the final uh, EIS for the master plan amendment, and um, the development uh, program is included here on the right. Uh, we have 750,000 gross square feet of, um, of building and this would be for offices, support uh, uh, spaces, as well as specialized spaces. Um, the FEMA headquarters will be a lead gold um, building and have uh, green roofs. In addition, GSA is proposing a 755 space parking garage for the 3,100 employees um, to be located on the site. Um, there is a tunnel that's being proposed that will um, connect the, uh, this portion of the east campus with the west campus. Um, here under um, Martin Luther King Avenue. Um, I'd also like to point out, um, I noted this a little earlier, but um, uh, Pecan Street, which is uh, going to be located here, and Pine Street are also um, in, included in the improvements for, uh, for transportation. Um, and you can see a very close-up uh, view of the um, plan for Martin Luther King um, Jr. Avenue. I'll uh, I have a section a little later on in the, in the uh, presentation to, uh, to show as well. <coughs> there are um, three main entrances to the site. Uh, there is the staff entrance for, from the parking garage. Uh, there is a entrance, um, pedestrian entrance, excuse me, um, along, the, uh, along Pecan Street and a, an entrance from the uh, underground tunnel um, to the site as well. Uh, there's an elevator that will lead down to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the, uh, the the tunnel, and so um, people will be allowed to. Um, this will allow people to travel from the parking um, areas and the west campus um, uh, over to the uh, the FEMA building um, uh, as well as as needed. Um, the Pecan Street um, entrance is uh, helpful in that its uh, connection to the west campus, as well as um, there are uh, planned bus uh, stops or shuttle stops that will connect um, the uh, metro station, which is uh, to the south, um, to, the, uh, to the, um, the east campus, to the, the FEMA headquarters here. Um, and um, um, Commissioner Tregroning um, brought this up a little bit a few minutes ago um, concerning the, um, the, the secure area. Uh, the FEMA site does have a, a double fence similar to the, um, the west campus. Um, uh, fence that was uh, that was approved by the commission uh, several years ago, um, but I will note that the parking garage is actually outside of that um, that that double fence that uh, that secure campus. There is a you can note a, a little fence here. This is actually for uh, more for safety um, than uh, than security. Um, this image is showing the landscape topology that GSA is proposing for the FEMA headquarters. Um, there is a uh, perimeter landscaping um, shown here. Uh, as well as uh, that surrounds the building, as well as several bioswale um, and bioretention areas here. And then there are several rain gardens that are being proposed as well. Um, I also noted earlier that uh, each of the roofs would be green roofs um, for, the, uh, for the buildings, as well as the, uh, the parking garage, which at this, uh, at this moment it ha also has um, photovoltaic, excuse me, photovoltaic 
uh, cells on the, uh, on the roof as well. Um, now for the transportation aspects of the, uh, of the project, we have um, the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue um, transportation work. Um, MLK improvements are focused on providing a safe vehicular turning movements onto the San Elizabeth, San Elizabeth campus and enhancing the, the pedestrian realm. GSA has worked with the district on developing these roadway enhancements and um, at the district, district's request, there's an option to add an additional 13 feet for a bike route um, uh, along um, MLK uh, as well. For the West Campus Access Road, the focus is on, um, uh, was on relocating the San Elizabeth traffic or employees from 295, which is shown here, um, and also local roads to a direct access um, to the San Elizabeth campus. And this was uh, being done um, while also trying to minimize impacts to um, Shepherd Parkway, um, which is again uh, highlighted here in, in green. And uh, Shepherd's Parkway, as I said earlier, is a National Park Service property. The district is also proposing um, some additional road, wo road work um, for the East Campus, and it's shown here in, uh, in yellow. I'm yeah. Now, the um, improvements for MLK Avenue this is a section looking at the existing, uh, which is at the top, and uh, what's being proposed now. Um, the existing has uh, four travel lanes, two in either direction, and sidewalks on either side, um, as well as some, uh, some plantings. Um, what's being proposed now is uh, two um, travel lanes in either direction and, and the additional uh, turn lane, um, which will um, uh, change depending on which direction turning there that people are trying to make. Um, also, uh, sidewalks um, on, on either side. Uh, what this is showing is that there is a um, uh, uh, one right of way that looks that that is uh, a right of way for the um, if you in, if you don't include the thirteen uh, the, the additional thirteen feet and then the um, I think this is dying and then the uh, additional thirteen feet um, for the uh, for the right of way. So this this uh, section will work. Um, uh, regardless of um, if the uh, if that that uh, bike path is uh, is created or not, but the option for creating the bike path is uh, is still um, is still uh, viable. Um, and this is the Shepherd Parkway um, interchange, or, or excuse me, the Malcolm X interchange uh, with uh, I uh, two ninety five, and it's through uh, the Shepherd Parkway um, uh, property. Even though these improvements are along the length um, of uh, 295 from South Capitol to um, South Capitol Street, Street to what, the East, Cam the West Campus of San Elizabeth, um, I'll focus mainly on this um, Malcolm X interchange. D uh, GSA and DHS have worked with NPS on finding ways to reduce the impacts um, of the access road and roadway interchange on the on Shepherd Parkway, and this design is the result of that process. DDOT and FWHA are, were also included in these discussions as well, as it is likely DDOT will have jurisdiction over this roadway once completed. While there are a number of improvements associated with the new Malcolm X um, I-295 interchange, uh, this image shows what's happened over time. And what I want to point out is um, there is a purple and a blue line that's here, and then there's the actual roadway that you see here. Um, this line that's here, that's kind of to the east, um, again, to this, this side is uh, this north. So to the east of this, this is actually a multi-purpose trail that's being proposed um, from, that will begin at, uh, at Firth Sterling, um, and it will continue through the West Campus, um, uh, through this portion of uh, Shepherd Parkway and down to um, uh, South Capitol Street. So um, what I was showing is the, this is what was being proposed um, uh, several years ago, and um, this is what's being proposed now. So there is um, the difference, there is a reduction in the amount of um, uh, land used for Shepherd Parkway. Um, what you're seeing here is, uh, again, these, this project is not uh, the final project. Um, it, this is part of the master plan, and uh, the, the, mat, the roadway itself will need to come to NCPC. Um, for a preliminary and final review in the future. Um, now, with the, uh, the transportation management plan, 
Um, GSA and DHS have also submitted a transportation technical report as well as an updated TMP for um, the master plan, which was stipulated in the 2009 um, uh, commission approval. This new transportation report evaluated all the new developments um, occurring around the uh, St. Elizabeth campus, um, as well as all the uh, roadways and intersections. Um, and uh, some of this information was not included in the 2008 um, uh, plan. Shown here in this slide is a summary of the TMP goal. Um, and as well as examples of strategies DHS has committed to use to reach uh, the uh, prescribed one uh, space to four employee ratio, um, as well as some monitoring um, that is uh, that uh, DHS and GSA are, are proposing. Um, staff reviewed the submitted um, documents and uh, focused on a few uh, items that are uh, shown here. Um, staff evaluated the project with regard to the district, uh, district's east campus development and found that similar massing, height, and form, um, and was comp these were compatible with what was being proposed by the district on the district's portion of the east campus. Staff al also reviewed the comprehensive uh, transportation management plan that GSA submitted and noted that while uh, it was aggressive, it would meet the one to four parking ratio stipulated by NCPC. Staff would um, uh, recommend further coordination with WMATA to ensure the success of shuttle service to the nearby metro rail stations. In addition, while GSA uh, uh, agrees that monitoring is important, I'm sorry, in um, addition, while DHS agrees that monitoring is important, the only employee survey that is committed to in the TMP is, is, um, would be following the full build out um, of the campus at 14,000 employees. Uh, employee surveys after phase one would help to uh, DHS understand what the future, um, which future surveys uh, would be uh, needed and, and helpful. Um, and finally, there are uh, several previous commission actions um, from the 2009 master plan um, approval that the staff evaluated as well. Um, these, were to uh, these were to verify the availability of Shepherd Parkway for use and to ensure uh, that the National Environmental Policy Act as well as the National Historic Preservation Act were completed for Shepherd Parkway. With the conclusion of the FHWA um, Section 4F process, noting that the land is available for use uh, as a roadway, um, the execution of a memorandum of, memorandum of agreement for Shepherd Parkway earlier this month and the issuance of a uh, rod for the final uh, environmental impact statement by both the General Services Administration as well as the Federal Highway Administration, staff finds that these um, previous commission actions have been satisfied. And um, therefore, staff concludes its evaluation of the master plan amendment, and the executive director recommends um, that the commission commend GSA and DHS for developing a well thought out, thorough master plan modification, and DHS, GSA, and FWHA for working with NPS to find a solution to the, the site ac access issue through Shepherd Parkway, approve the master plan modification for um, the DHS consolidation uh, at St. Elizabeth and um, transportation improvements, which include construction of the 750,000 gross square foot building and the 755 uh, space parking garage for 3,100 employees on the East Campus, widening Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and constructing an access road and interchange on Shepherd Parkway. Um, note that designs for the FEMA headquarters building and associated parking garage, um, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue widening and new access road through Shepherd Parkway would need to be submitted to the commission for approval find that GSA has met the Commission's requirement that Shepherd Parkway be available for use, as stipulated in the 2009 approval of the, D of the 2008 uh, DHS Consolidation Master Plan, Encourage, uh, excuse me, encourages GSA uh, and DHS to continue coordination with the District of Columbia government on the planning process for the East Campus development to ensure strong connections and a cohesive design between the federal use parcel and the rest of the campus. Note that uh, GSA and DHS com uh, commitment to continue working with WMATA on a plan to provide shuttle service between the nearby Metro Royal stations and the DHS headquarters at uh, St. Elizabeth's and identifying other transit opportunities. And finally, require GSA and DHS to conduct further uh, employee surveys, excuse me, to conduct employee surveys on a semi-annual basis in the first year of operation for the U.S. Coast Guard building to understand the effectiveness of the TMP and to make adjustments accordingly. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Very good. Um, I, would move, I would move it. Move the recommendation. All right. It's been, it's been moved and seconded now for discussion purposes. Um, I do note that we have uh, a contingency from DHS uh, project experts who are available to us. 
um, <coughs> discussion among the commission. Ms. Greenwald. I just thought I had two quick questions. The slide with discussing the parking garage for FEMA, okay. did that, is the only access point to that garage on Pine? Yes. And is that part of the TMP and sort of, you know, yes. the improvements to that street and make sure that it doesn't? Yes. Um, and then the other question was with regards to um, the requirement for the study for the after the Coast Guard building. I, I, I just was hoping you could discuss that a little bit more. Sure. And um, I guess I, I'm curious as to, you know, how strongly the the recommendation is with regards to semi-annual in particular. I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's really... Um, uh, because the TMP, it stipulates that um, DHS is committed to uh, conducting an employee survey for um, for the for the site. That's that's not the issue. Um, they do basically look. Well, they do look at only having the employee survey done after fourteen thousand um, employees are on the site. Um, there is a contingency that says, well, they might be able to do them more frequently, but we'll kind of decide that. Um, you know, at a later date, and I uh, really the recommendation is just to make that you really need to understand what's happening after the Coast Guard is open because that's um, going to be happening fairly in, in fairly short order. So understanding what what you have it would be <coughs> helpful to to understand what the impacts are um, and what the um, and and how well um, and and what fo what the employees are or how the employees are getting to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, the site. Uh, and it's easier to do that earlier than wait till um, the uh, full 14,000 uh, folks are there, or wait till some other indeterminate time period. This is this just helps to give a, a very determinate um, period. And, and I don't disagree with um, with that. And it's just looking at two um, uh, surveys. Right. I, I guess the question I had was, you know, it, I think I don't know exactly what the Coast Guard's phased time, phase move in time is. You know, whether they'll have be fully staffed within the first six months of it opening and just you know wasn't quite clear here and if there was a way to provide a little bit more flexibility for you know GSA and DHS to definitely do that kind of survey and understand what you know use the Coast Guard as a basis for how the rest of it will play out I think that's really important but I'm not sure if, if this is a little bit more restrictive than necessary in the language and if it's sort of the best is that but it looks like Harry I was just going to say that um, the district has also got a lot of um, ancillary efforts associated with the Coast Guard's uh, occupancy of the West Campus uh, in terms of uh, food service and other amenities. And as you know, our plans for the East Campus evolve a very, uh, uh, it's very evolutionary in terms of the land use. And so the notion that um, travel patterns might change um, in the way that we were talking about in the, for the previous um, in the previous discussion, uh, I think is even mu is going to be much more dramatic here. So keeping some close tabs on how those travel patterns might be changing as amenities are added and other uses come to the site, um, I think is probably a smart thing to do given how very constrained uh, the the automobile network is in the area. And uh, further, I mean, I think Harry just sort of furthered my point, which is that you know semi-annual might not be the best way because you know the food will come, and I don't think that's on a quite a clear timeline yet and that should impact when the study is done perhaps to be most effective. I'm always confused by the term semi-annual if that's several <laughs> times a year or every several years. So annual is, is several times. It is, is like every two years. Every so more frequently than a year is what semi-annual is. Right, twice, twice a year right. in the first year. year. Okay. Okay, so, so, so with some frequency while these things are changing. <laughs> right, and so maybe just... Semi-annual is what? Semi-annual is twice a year. Six months or so, yes. Sort of like retention and detention. Well, given that the... <laughs> so, so, but, but semi-annual could mean you're just finishing one survey and then getting the results and doing something with it and starting all over again. If, if I, did not, I did not understand that semi-annual. You know, I don't attend white sales or else I probably would know what semi-annual means. Um, so so that, that does seem pretty um, um, a little much 
just the way these things go internally in a federal context, by the time you've finished one survey, interpreting the, the results and moving to the, you know, so that you can do something about it, you'd be designing and starting the next one. I mean, I agree with the idea because added to all these things too is, is to what extent uh, DHS does or does not embrace the mobile workplace, and that could have a significant change, um, render a significant change in traffic patterns and all kinds of things. And so I get that we need to do it, but it just seems a little bit too often. Mr. Chairman. Um, Sir. Yeah, I guess we should be monitoring, not semi or annually, but monitoring this thing, because a lot's going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, I really wondered about the widening of MLK. The widening will be accommodated by taking space on both sides or on the east, east side primarily? East only. East, east only? Yes. Good. I, I'm, because the wall is a problem on the other side. Uh, secondly, historical wall. Secondly, how far down? You, you seem to be stopping at the end of the campus. Is that going to, I mean, I don't know how, is that going to carry all the way down to the metro station or to the 14th Street Bridge or, I mean, I know that represents a lot of problems, but is it going to bottleneck all of a sudden you got it wide then you got it narrowed yeah. again when you get to. Yeah, the same group. Exactly. Start, exactly. <laughs> well, I think where, the, where um, start, where does it end? The, yeah, the, the, the widening is really just for the turning movements. I mean, there are going to be four turning. lanes, ah. be lanes regardless. Okay. So those will stay. It's just though. So that the pattern is the same there. except in that area for yeah. turning. That's yeah. very good. Also, how much of this is, uh, uh, and you all talk about alternative trans but transit, I'm a, we, this trolley issue is still live and, and doing things. Uh, anything, is any anticipation there or are you just leaving that as an alternative that might help with the problem? City can probably speak to that better than you can. I don't know. Maybe I should talk to you off, off, off record on that one. Good. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other, other discussion, uh, Ms. White, then Mr. Provencher. I just wanted to offer a comment on the landscape framework plan and how it came across in the conceptual drawings. And I thought it was fantastic to see so many green roofs mm -hmm. in that concept drawing, and that it's so pedestrian friendly and innovative. Rainwater, um, what did you call it? Stormwater rain gardens, particularly after the last discussion. So I compliment you and look forward to seeing the details as you develop them. Mr. Chairman, I would have to add and say that I'm very pleased to have an image before us of looking at the city from east of the river to the city. <laughs> this, this, was a, this was kind of overwhelming for me to see that kind of picture because we usually kind of see us. The other way, you know, there they are over there across the river. Here we are on this side looking at, it's like those cartoon pictures they had of the center of the universe is whatever you want it to be and everything else is kind of graphically around it. Fra I appreciate Fra that. I should, Fra Fra I should get a copy of that when they enlarge yeah, on my house Framed and signed red rigs will be available. That's what I need. Thank you. Mr. Prevention. A couple of comments. Uh, Remind us again, what's the disposition of the buildings that are demolished on the site? Did I hear a, a veteran shelter or a replacement of kind, in kind yeah, somewhere I, else in the, I, in the area? I think GSA, they're, they're here. They can answer the, um, what's going to go on. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure the buildings are actually empty right now. I was, was curious about who is going to be displaced and if they were going to have some alternatives down the road, particularly our, our veterans groups. With regard to the homeless shelter, the District uh -huh. of Columbia has not decided um, the new location of the shelter, but it will be displaced as part of this development. Okay. This is Nia Francis from the Office I'm of sorry. Planning and Design Quality. <laughs> but I'm bumped. Unfortunate. Okay. Uh, reflecting back on the previous uh, project uh, at Bethesda and the huge involvement of the neighborhood groups, what's been the Ward 8 neighborhood homeowners in involvement in the planning for these projects? There's been there's been a considerable amount of of, of work with right. Uh, with we have eight, extensive so. community coordination. We participate uh -huh. in monthly Ward Eight Trans transportation task force meetings. We also have our um, community meetings uh, on campus monthly as well, um, discussing several issues. You know, business development, job participation. Right, right. Um, as well as the, the just general community concerns. Mm -hmm. Job participation, are you envisioning something similar to what the Coast Guard folks did with, a, with an employment center? I, I realize uh, that we're talking about master planning, but right, we have related issues. We have an opportunities trailer located on the campus where 
uh, community members can go to apply for a job, see what job openings mm -hmm. are, are being listed. We also conduct some training uh, at the Opportunity Trailer as well. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, one of the slides, I think it was 13, showed uh, signals. I, I think I'm a little bit familiar with that intersection, particularly uh, where it joins uh, Bowling Air Force Base, now JBAB. Aren't, aren't several of those signals uh, existing signals as opposed to a new part of the Malcolm X in interchange? Um, yeah, can Both at, at the main gate as well as the uh, exit ramp off of 295? I think those yeah, are existing there's, there's signals there's, as opposed there's a lot to going on signals. There. <laughs> okay. there right. some, there's some uh, ramps that are going on there right. um, as well as, um, and the signals yeah, the the one that's actually at um, South Capitol and so on, uh, the slide, the slide thirteen. Yeah. <coughs> I say it takes me a long time to get through here. No problem. There you go. So, yeah. and I hope this the, doesn't. Th oh, this one currently exists. Oh. That one currently exists. So I think this this yeah, is the, that would is be the new, new part, but, yes. but these yes. are existing. Okay. I, I, I would just say I think that there are going to be improvements to the timing of those signals. That's why they show on this diagram that they're going to calibrate all of the uh, all of the traffic operations with these new interchanges. I mm -hmm. think that's what it was intended to convey. Per perhaps some integrated quarter management type of efforts like we're seeing uh, elsewhere. Okay. Yes. Do I hear you say League Gold? Yes. The reason I'm asking is DOD recently came out with a little bit more restrictive policy to stay at silver, and you can go gold, but you have to cost justify anything above silver. So yeah. that's that's not a government-wide initiative? <clears throat> no, it's not. Um, I'm supported by the director of the program here at uh -huh. St. Elizabeth's. Um, actually, we're, our baseline is elite silver. Right. However, we've been able to achieve lead gold on all, all our projects so far and with mm -hmm. minimal cost. So anything beyond gold, it becomes mm -hmm. a little bit more costly. So you don't have that same restriction in your agency? Okay, we, we excellent. Don't. Okay, all right. And lastly, I want to compliment, compliment Mr. Hart on the comprehensive uh, report as well as the proper pronunciation of some of the street names, uh, Pecan, for example, as opposed <laughs> to what the Yankees call Pecan. I, 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 have a, I have a so, southern mother, so, so I, that's many all were, I hear. Many of her are blessed with grandmothers that make pecan pie as opposed to what you get in New York City, which is pecan pie. It's so not the same. <laughs> Mr. Goni. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the work of GSA and the Department of Homeland Security uh, in advancing this uh, amendment to the uh, consolidated master plan um, and and uh, also just say that we will have before the Commission opportunities to look at preliminary and final designs for the FEMA building and for the transportation improvements um, and to also say that for this on the city's part that we're uh, working very hard to move uh, uh, coordinated development activity on the East Campus so that it it uh, becomes a safe uh, amenity-rich, uh, mixed-use environment that will uh, enhance the work experience for uh, uh, for uh, DHS employees and their visitors, uh, but also have, uh, especially on the East Campus, much more interaction uh, between the neighborhood and uh, uh, and the activities of, uh, of of FEMA in particular. So I would just urge the um, the approval of the EDR. Thank you. And seconded and also uh, uh, mentioned that the, there's another pocket on the west side which may be uh, another off the right that we need to discuss a lot of like players lounge Georgina's and all that area there that's got to be looking across the street at all this wonderful stuff. I'm sure you will talk I second it and I'm supportive a couple of commissioners had concerns about the survey perhaps we I could was bring that up momentarily. We, we could uh, um, do a, fr a friendly modification or an amendment to that survey yeah, requirement bit of attention um, but no one offered any amendment and per perhaps a, a, a single survey at the end of the first year and reporting to NCPC otherwise I'm not sure mm -hmm. we would even know what the results of the survey something in that vein okay so what I have at the moment was uh, required GSA and DHS to conduct employee surveys twice within the first two years of the opening of the US Coast Guard building 
Um, I didn't include report language to NCPC. We could, uh, I mean, it says to uh, make adjustments to the TMP as it goes further, so I think that would be sufficient, and you know, yeah. we'll certainly hear about it through that if any adjustments are made. So, so you want to repeat for? Sure, gladly. Requires GSA and DHS to conduct employee surveys twice within the first two years of the opening of the U.S. Coast Guard building, and then okay. keep the rest. How would you feel about dropping GSA from that and letting DHS survey their own employees? Because we could slow them down, you know, um, I've, I've heard willfully. That <laughs> um, um, if DHS, they were on their own, it might go faster. Yeah. DHS wants to say okay. <laughs> they say okay, sure, gladly. Okay, so Ms. Young, you have that amendment as well. Hmm? So it just requires DSA to conduct. Uh, a survey twice within the first two years of operation. Okay. Mr. Miller? Yes, I just wanted to, uh, as a seconder of the approval motion, uh, to uh, speak in favor of it and associate myself with Commissioner Tregoning's remarks. This is a very uh, important uh, e economic development project for Ward 8 and for the city uh, as a whole, Indeed. obviously. Thank you. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded uh, um, without Sensing no further discussion, the EDR is amended. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's approved unanimously. We have one last item on our agenda, and it's, uh, um, it's an information presentation. It's item 6A. If the audience members will exit quietly. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Fort yeah, agenda Belvoir. item 6A is information presentation on the Fort Belvoir North Post Town Center concept design. Uh, Mr. Wheel. Thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon. Uh, Fort Belvoir is here today to uh, uh, give an informational presentation on the North Post Town Center framework de uh, development plan. Uh, as a little background, the purpose of this presentation is, um, number one, to respond to commission concerns about the undefined nature of the town center design. Uh, during its review of the PX Shopping Center project uh, last summer, uh, and two, to provide the commission with additional planning context for the new uh, Fort Belvoir Commissary, which will be a part of the town center, and the commission will be reviewing that for preliminary approval in October 2012. So during the, the past year, NCPC staff has met with the Army several times to discuss the town center, and from that, the Army now has a refined framework development plan, which will be incorporated into the Draft Fort Belvoir Master Plan update, and the Army will be submitting that Draft Fort Commission review in fall of 2012. Uh, and, as, and as a last note, as you know, NCPC hosted a speaker series presentation last month on sustainable installation design, and the revised Unified Facilities Criteria, or UFC, was released in conjunction with that event. The 2012 UFC contains 10 overarching planning concepts, and before the Army presents their design, I'd like to briefly touch upon several of these, which I think best apply uh, to the framework plan. So number one, healthy uh, community planning. Uh, which is planning for opportunities and features that contribute to the health of the people who live and work uh, on an installation by providing things like recreational fields, bicycle lanes, and community gardens to promote active and healthful uh, lifestyles. Uh, number two, network planning, which is the idea of making sure that installations are really tied together through good utility uh, and transportation connectivity. And the presentation will show uh, the North Post Town Center's future connections to other nearby areas through transit, bicycling, uh, traffic calming, and walking. Uh, and third and last, area develop, uh, development planning, which is the concept of focusing an installation's planning efforts on smaller scale districts in order to create uh, identifiable places within the installation. And this framework development plan represents this type of effort to create an identifiable North Post Town Center District uh, on a scale that is comparable to an area development plan. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the presentation over to uh, Chris Landgraf, uh, who is the Chief Master Planner at Fort Belvoir. 
uh, and he'll walk you through uh, um, the, the North Post Town Center Framework Design Plan uh, in, uh, in more detail. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen of the Commission and NCPC staff. Uh, as Michael said, I'm Chris Langraf, the Master Planner for Fort Belvoir. Uh, today I would like to expand on a discussion that started in July of 2011 uh, and present an updated framework plan for the North Post Town Center at Fort Belvoir. The Commission was concerned about the undefined nature of the North Post Town Center as shown previously with the Post Exchange Project. Specifically, the concerns focused on walkability, mixed use, trans transit options, placemaking, and sustainability. Uh, my presentation today should demonstrate that Fort Belvoir is incorporating these principles into our designs and that we will carry these designs elements forward in our master plan update. I should note that all but two of the photos you will see in this presentation are for, from Fort Belvoir specific projects. Uh, before I get started though with the presentation, I would like to say thank you to the NCPC staff for all the guidance and direction that they have uh, provided during this process. NCPC staff participated in a design charrette at Fort Belvoir for the North Post Town Center and Commissary in February of this year and have continued to help us refine our plans. The recommendations have been extremely helpful to Fort Belvoir and we appreciate their assistance. As you can see from the slide before you, the land use designation for the North Post Town Center is community support. The Town Center will have housing, professional institutional facilities, and troop land uses immediately adjacent to the Town Center. Uh, this is a housing area. These are professional institutional in the blue and troop down here in the gray. The town center um, and all of these uh, land uses will help support the retail elements of the town center in the future. The following amenities exist within walking distance of the proposed town center. Uh, walking distances are measured by two circles as shown here, uh, an inner and outer. The inner circle is uh, 1,320 feet or a quarter mile. The outer circle is uh, 2,000 feet, um, as was discussed earlier about walking distances. And these represent uh, walking times of approximately 10 to 15 minutes. And as you can see from the marker here, the proposed town center that we're discussing is actually in this location here to tie all of the elements that are within this area together. And that would be accomplished with the future road system. But the amenities that are existing today are we have a shopette, we have a bank, and we have a movie theater. There is a fitness facility, chapel, and community pool. We have Fort Belvoir Elementary School and Lewis Village with its 900 residents and community center. We also have on the periphery a existing child development center and we're building a child development center within the walking distance circles as shown on the, on the slide. The framework plan you see in this slide was developed in coordination with NCPC staff. We believe this framework will give us flexibility to adapt the design based on an updated housing market analysis due in 2014 and any changes to the proposed projects planned in and around the town center. The components of the framework plan, as you can see in the legend of the side, are we have community support facilities identified on the edge of the town center. We have that tied in together with a mixed use development area and a transitional space between the mixed use and housing areas. And then we have green space and recreational activities uh, inside the town center limits. Some of the design elements that are included in the framework plan are the establishment of pedestrian pathways as shown by the hatching on the sides here and through the town center. Um, and the creation of pedestrian promenades as shown in front of the new commissary facility that connect to the post exchange, uh, the pedestrian promenades as shown here in the renderings. This is this Part of the building right here in the bottom rendering is actually the entrance to the uh, me to lose the entrance to the actual PX, and this same pedestrian promenade aspect will be carried up through the PX area as well. Our intention 
for the North Post Town Center is to create a development area that has all the design elements we have incorporated in our South Post Town Center, such as pedestrian amenities shown here in the bottom left, on-street parking shown in both these photos on the top, and to create a, a sense of place for people when they are walking along the uh, and through the town center area um, to, to identify that they're in the town center. The Fort Beauvoir South Post Town Center that is shown here in these, slot, in these photos was recently recognized as the first mixed-use town center in the Army. And we are committed to continuing the design elements used in South Post in our master plan update and North Post Town Center. Additional framework design elements include the creation of nodes that allow visitors to gather and enjoy outdoor spaces. And design elements within the node will identify that they're within the town center as shown here in Bethesda. And then mixed use development with the option for restaurants included as storefronts and at potential node locations uh, as shown here in Fair Lakes. They're also being considered for elements of the town center. And all of the proposed elements will help Fort Belvoir recreate the award-winning mixed-use development of Fort Belvoir South Post Town Center by providing a variety of housing and recreational activities that are adjacent to the town center location here again at the node and the combination of the community support and the transition across the entire town center. The following amenities are proposed around the town center uh, in the future in both our short and long-range plan. We have a car care center proposed. We have the commissary again, which we discussed before. There will be a casual dining facility and the recreation of our uh, South Post mixed-use development. The housing will have allow for various types of housing, different styles along the uh, road frontage and then styles as were shown previously uh, in the backer parts of or the back parts depending on the uh, 2014 housing market analysis. And then we also have in our master plan, uh, we're carrying forward a future expansion of the elementary school, uh, religious education center, and recreational activities adjacent to the pool like tennis courts. The town center is designed to be a pedestrian friendly and allow for a variety of transit options. As you can see from the slide in front of you, we have identified locations and walking distances to the mixed use development in this case instead of the actual town center because we figure this is the main retail hub. Um, and most of those fall within the discussion that was earlier about the 10 to 15 minute walking distance. Um, and they connect all the way down to our troop centers as well as our reserve component areas to provide access for people via walking or pedest uh, other pedestrian or bike transit lanes. Elements that we plan to carry forward are uh, street line trees, uh, street line, tree line streets, and as shown here looking on Gorgas Road, uh, which runs right in here currently, and then uh, adding new pedestrian uh, sidewalks and bike paths as we're building currently on Gunston Road. Pedestrian pathways exist now at our troop housing area, McRae Barracks, and at the Woodlawn Chapel area. And these areas will be uh, expanded with tree planting and pedestrian amenities in the future. The installation design guide, or IDG, is a part of the real property master plan at Fort Belvoir and provides examples of seating, wayfinding, and bus shelters that will be carried forward for uh, the town cellar elements. Oops, sorry, the town center will also incorporate a, via, a variety of uh, traffic calming features, as Michael mentioned, such as speed tables at crosswalks, and in, we're investigating uh, tra traffic circles uh, around the town center areas. We also are planning for a variety of pavement types, um, pavement, special pavement areas such as this brick pavement area will be used to identify that you're in the town center area and then using porous pavement to reduce the impervious surface areas for things such as fire lanes like we have at the United States Army Legal Services Administration, and then using uh, porous concrete or uh, like we have at uh, our LEED certified uh, platinum facility at Fairfax Village. Uh, those areas, those elements will be carried through in both the IDG and into the town center, the development elements. 
Thank you for allowing me to present this update for you today. And the design elements presented today, will, as Michael stated, will be included in the commissary presentation uh, next month, or I'm sorry, in September. And then a master plan update that you guys will see in the fall of this year. May I answer any questions or address any comments from the commission? Thank you, Mr. Landgraf. This is a project that, as you know, has been long, of, long interest uh, to us. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Landgraf? Mr. Provencher. I think uh, the Belvoir planning efforts should uh, should be uh, commended. We're we're very encouraged uh, by what we see. Uh, one of the Belvoir Valiant warriors uh, recently retired, uh, Colonel Mark Moffat. Colonel Moffat was the deputy installation commander for the BRAC projects, and during his short five-year tenure, helped me with the numbers: four plus billion dollars in construction of over four million square feet. Yes, sir. At uh, Belvoir, and they're not done yet. No, sir. So uh, I think a, a very tangible and very uh, Im impressive uh, step forward for that uh, installation. Um, we're going to be losing another valiant warrior, General uh, Colonel uh, John Strakula is leaving the 25th, the Belvoir commander, and it's going to be replaced by Colonel Gadsden. So we look forward to uh, sustaining the momentum and the, the joint collaborative efforts. Uh, Belvoir is to be commended, I think, on a variety of things. Community outreach is another good example. There have been solid members for many years of the Quantico Belvoir Business Alliance and that uh, relationship is continuing. So we look forward to this fall seeing the final presentation of the, of the master plan also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langraff. We look forward to seeing you in September. Thank and you, sir. again Have in the fall day. with the master plan. Thanks so much. Uh, anything else to come before the, the commission? Hearing none, thank you for your attention. One comment, if I could, please. Very productive session uh, hosted uh, jointly by the NCPC yes. and the Council of Governments on the 17th of May, right. where we rolled out the, the, the new uh, installation master planning unified facilities criteria. The follow-on plan to, uh, as that uh, is implemented, the, the timing, one of the things we do in our business is always you have to look at the codes and standards that are in effect at the time you're doing your design and construction. So the Belvoir plan will be informed by this new uh, UFC. But uh, and, and will be modified. And fortunately, it was as was pointed out, it complies with many of the uh, elements. Um, the the follow on uh, Admiral Manselman that was here earlier was a, was a one of the participants. That was a joint effort between uh, some elements within Department of Defense, uni uh, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and others. And the plan is to roll that out here in the National Capital Region first in the July August time frame to have a session for DOD planners from the 12 or so installations that are in the National Capital, Corps of Engineers and others, and then a follow-on uh, session with the uh, NCPC planners. So everybody has a, a common and joint understanding of those requirements. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attendance. It's been a long meeting, and uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>